Welcome everyone to a new edition of Godot.com Online. We hope that next year it will be possible again to host Godot.com in the traditional hybrid format. This means physical and online. But for this year, we have decided to host both editions online, so you won't miss the event. The contributors organizing did a great job bringing this new edition together, and the speakers prepare a collection of very interesting talks for you to enjoy. About Godot development, I wanted to let you know that 2021 has been a great year so far. There are more developers contributing than ever, and many of them are hired full-time thanks to your generous donations. We are currently hard at work ironing out the last details and features so we can have an alpha version published soon. I hope all of you will have a lot of fun tinkering with it. This has been our biggest effort so far. The code base has been rebuilt from the ground up, like a lot of new systems, a lot of new code. This will result in quality, usability, and performance being a lot of improved. So with this said, I want to welcome you to enjoy the talks and discuss with other attendants with our hostess Rocket Chat instance. We have dedicated channels for all the talks so you can continue discussions there. Good luck. Have fun. Welcome everyone to my talk, Building a Community with Godot Engine. My name is Miguel and I'm a German software engineer currently based in London. And I'm building games for the past 10 years and I started using Godot around 12 months ago. I also do pixel art and I compose my own music and sound effects. I'm also a host of Game Dev London and I help organizing Go Godot Jam with over 700 participants. And this is my current project. It's called Cave. It's a working title. And you are in this giant mountain and you encounter dwarves, you forge and mine minerals, and you uncover the secrets by solving puzzles and by talking to these dwarves. But how did I get there? It started with games in Java. So my first programming language was Java and C++. And the first thing I've built was that. So this is a infinite, procedurally generated 2D universe space shooter, and you can land on planets and all that jazz. Of course, nothing of that worked because in my head, before I even started the game, I was like, oh man, I want to build this game now. And I thought that should be easy. And I started developing it and I just realized that it was a fatal mistake. I eventually abandoned the game because it was a mess and it never actually exited the prototype stage. I still had rough shapes and boxes, as you can see, and I even didn't come to the part of game dev, but I tried to solve technical problems. I also developed a game called Scape, and I think not many people know about that game. It's a complete game. You can play it on each arrow, but it's also written in Java. And the reason why I not hugely promoted this game is due to its compatibility issues. I noticed that on various platforms, the game just crashes or it hangs. And building games in Java taught me the lesson that I spent most of my time solving technical challenges. I got kind of sick of it. So I thought, okay, hold on. Breathe for a minute. What can we do here? And, uh, I had to aim smaller, right? And I discovered this amazing project by McFunky Pants called One Game a Month. And unfortunately, One Game a Month doesn't exist any longer. But at that time, it was amazing to see this project because you are supposed to build one game a month, as the title says. And it's all about keeping your streak. It doesn't mean that your game needs to be amazing or huge or feature rich. It's just about you doing game dev. And this really helped me to realize how to deal with feature creep. And one game I, for example, created is called Pragma. And it's a horror game about a young boy looking for his dog in the dark forest. And I won't spoil more because that game is still creepy to me. It's a short game, but it was one of the first games I've created within a week that is complete I actually could say, hey, I've built this and I knew the limitations straight away. And this was due to this. I created an entire framework called BrainGDX around a library in Java called LibGDX. And my goal of this was actually to tackle all these technical challenges I would need to solve previously. 
unfortunately, I noticed that what I'm currently doing there is trying to build some sort of game engine. And it got so bad that I spent 90% of my game dev time on solving technical challenges. That was not really how I wanted to spend my time. And I got really stuck. I got really stuck and I got frustrated. And I actually abandoned game dev for a while, for a couple of months. And I thought to myself, how can I rediscover the fun in game development? And then someone came into my life. Godot Engine, yeah. It was a warm summer evening. I think it wasn't even summer. It was somewhere in spring. And I was browsing through YouTube. I was quite bored and I discovered this channel, DevDuck. Um, ben, he's amazing. Subscribe to him if you haven't already. And I watched these devlogs and I've never really seen a devlog before. I, I wasn't really aware that was a thing. And I just watched all of them and I thought, wow, I want to do that as well. That's amazing. And another channel I then found was Harpeast. And Harpeast actually has a tutorial series on Godot Engine and to get started. And it, I spent like four to five days doing all the tutorials and getting myself familiar with Godot Engine. And after doing that, I was like, man, I really want to start my own devlog channel and also build games. This is so, this is just so cool. And before I did that, I thought to myself, okay, but how do I, how do I start? Because I watched all these devlogs and they all looked super polished and they had all like thousands of, subs of subscribers and I thought, okay, I, I need some sort of start. So I thought, okay, I need the following ingredients. I need a game idea. I need a camera for B-roll footage and because it just makes your video nicer. And I actually need a YouTube channel. And with that YouTube channel, I also need some sort of branding or some sort of idea because without that, I'm just one of many and people will not really notice me. And I really wanted to share with everyone what ideas I might have. So I created Bitbrain. And Bitbrain was already an online handle I used for many years. But I thought, okay, let's just make this a thing of my devlog future. So I called it Bitbrain. And uh, I had some principles. So my first principle was quality first. So I didn't want to rush anything and the the idea is I'm quite a perfectionist and I also suffer under imposter syndrome a bit. So I'm never really happy with my work and I think many of you have similar a similar thing going on. And I just had to put quality first. And also know your constraints. In all these years doing game dev and failing and failing, I learned that the number one thing that prevented me from finishing a game was always feature creep. And I had all these ideas in my head and I thought, oh man, that would be so cool to build. But then in practice, it first of all, it wasn't really fun, but also it wouldn't, wouldn't see an end. It would just keep going and keep going and keep piling up. And, and the third rule I said to myself was slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So for people checking out my YouTube channel, you might notice I don't have that many videos uploaded and also the frequency is quite inconsistent as well. Many YouTubers, they have this sort of schedule where they say, okay, I'm going to drop a new devlog every two weeks and or every Sunday, this kind of stuff. And I thought about doing that as well. But when I tried doing that, I noticed that it would put huge stress on myself. And I also thought, why? Because if your goal is to grow fast, that might be a good opportunity or a, a good strategy. But my goal was never really to become as fast, as, as big as possible as a YouTube channel. But I just wanted to show what I'm working on with the highest quality in mind. So this is why that wasn't really an option. So instead, I just upload a video when I feel like it, basically. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I started building this. So it is called Cave. 
And this was around eight months ago. It was the first prototype where you just walk around, right? And you could already mine things, but you can see the animations are a bit wonky and you can't really do much. And also there's not a real cave. It's just all blocks you can mine away. And then I basically created a devlog on that. So my first devlog went live in August last year. And I basically showed what I was working on and why I wanted to do devlogging in the first place. And then three months passed. I By then I released a second devlog on the lighting system. So I made the visuals a bit nicer and polished the game a bit and also added a menu and stuff like that. And then um, something happened, basically, then. Something happened. At the end of November, it was suddenly blowing up. And by blowing up, I mean I opened the front page of itch.io and you would scroll down, like, one one um, screen size and you could see, see my game on the title page. And I saw the icon and I was like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> Uh, and I think till today, I still don't quite know. It, it, it just kind of happened. And I got hundreds, not hundreds, you can see 128 comments in total. Uh, and over 13,000 views and over 7,500 browser plays till today. And even two people paid me money. I earned already six dollars. <laughs> uh, yay, <laughs> I already earned six dollars. And I don't know who they who they are, but thank you so much. And uh, yeah, this basically happened, and it gave me a huge confident confidence boost in in pursuing that further and further. So the next thing I basically did was I set up a Discord server. Till that point, I really didn't do that because all I wanted to do was just putting my work out there and show people what I'm what I was working on. And I saw many other YouTubers having a Discord server, but I, I always thought, ah, it's, it's just some extra maintenance and no one really joins that. And what's the point, you know? And then I realized that having a Discord server has a lot of benefits and building your own brand and also your own community um, helps you to, first of all, stay motivated because you hold yourself accountable, right? Uh, you can also share your work with other people that are generally interested in in your work. You can also discuss devlogs and get feedback, and you can also celebrate game development together, right? Because my Discord server is not about me. <laughs> it's about everyone. And uh, also chatting and streaming, right? You can just join a channel and then share your screen and just share your game development. And you can um, let a bot join that plays some nice lo-fi music in the background, you know, and then other people can just join and watch. Until December 2020, so around six months ago or seven months ago, I still wasn't really sure what Cave actually is. So I created this procedurally generated game. At least the, the caves are procedurally generated and... I thought, okay, you just have a bit of mining and then you forge weapons or tools with it and that's it. And I think that wasn't really enough and that concept wasn't really thought through. And many people also in the YouTube comments pointed out the similarities to games like Minecraft or Terraria. And uh, when thinking about my game, I actually don't think of it as a Terraria or Minecraft clone. But it wasn't really clear, and I think it's still not really clear, but I actually started writing down the constraints and the direction I want to take the game to. So instead of having this open-world sandbox game where the player can do whatever they want, I want them to have the experience in a linear story-based game. And I want to have a game where you have interactions with characters in the game, and you actually uncover the secrets of the mountain and solve puzzles. And I actually planned version 1.0 through till the end in terms of story already. And I know exactly how the game will roughly evolve. And 
I'm also thinking about adding puzzles and things like mining shafts and stuff like that. But generally, I want to move away from this here's a cave, just mine your way and find treasure to a linear story-based game where you have to solve puzzles and help these dwarves to... Um, yeah, help help these dwarves with their problems. I, I won't go into too much into detail now, but basically that's what the future of the game holds. And uh, in the next devlogs, you will see more about how the dialogue system works. I'm planning to use Dialogic. Uh, it's a great plugin for Godot Engine. And um, I'm also going to show the actual forging mechanic and also the progression system as well. And also reputations with the various dwarven Hi, and welcome to my talk, Godot in the Clouds, Patterns for Cloud-Based Backends in Godot. As you can see, my name is Kyle Slinsky. Uh, here's a series of links that you can follow that are very helpful. The first one is a link to the Firebase REST API-based plugin that my team and I manages for Godot. Uh, it's an extremely useful plugin for implementing the patterns that you're going to see following. Here's my YouTube channel, and if you help me get to a thousand subscribers, I'll make a tutorial to show you how I made the game Hero Babysitter's Club, which you should go download and play while I talk. So why do I like to talk about cloud-based backends in the first place? What are they useful for? That sort of thing. It's actually sort of got a funny story to start with. I had started programming with Unity back in the day, and I found a site called parse.com. It was extremely useful, and I'm a mobile developer by day, and so I don't like things like databases or you know, making calls to the internet, stuff like that, making service calls. They all kill the battery, so I just don't like them. But when you have a cloud-based backend and specifically a JSON document database, they're really easy to use. You don't have to worry about so much SQL. You don't have to learn too many new technologies. They're all just very straightforward. You add a listener, you get notified of updates, and that's that. You figure out what to do based on those updates. So I was using parse.com 
And as soon as I started getting good at it and starting to make tutorials for my channel and such, uh, Facebook bought it. They straight up bought Parse.com and closed it. Thanks, Facebook. So naturally, I went looking for an alternative. What I ended up finding was Firebase. Firebase was purchased by Google shortly after, but I knew that Google was much better for developers than Facebook was. And I figured they probably wouldn't close it. And sure enough, they ended up creating an absolutely amazing service. And all the other providers now have it. Amazon's got it. Microsoft's got it. There are free alternatives called Superbase and so on. There's plenty of them uh, now that they're uh, starting to get popular. But this talk will be mostly just about the technologies and the patterns, not so much the specifics of the technologies. And I should emphasize this talk is also not about security. A lot of these patterns that I'm going to be mentioning are fairly dangerous, so you want to be very careful with them. You want to protect yourself in all instances, use authentication. The Firebase plugin that I talked about earlier that my team and I manage, that has authentication built in, including anonymous authentication. So you end up getting the workflow for authentication without having to actually have your users put in an email and password. They, it gives them a unique identifier and remembers that identifier per machine that it's on. So it's really, really nice. So what are cloud-based backends actually good for? They're particularly good for things like online scoreboards. You can sort things in different ways and list them in different ways, all based on the same list, which is extremely nice. For things like chat, in fact, Firebase itself was built as a chat backend. And that is extremely useful for not clogging up the pipes with Godot or Godot. As you can see, this little app that I made here was actually made for the Nokia Game Jam. And this would work perfectly fine. The Firebase plugin is supported across all platforms that Godot supports. Finally, we arrived at what I'm going to talk about. No, not uh, into the breach like you see here. This is actually just sort of meant to be turn-based games because what cloud-based backends are really not good at is anything physics-based. So you don't want to use it for anything that requires real-time updates, but what you can use it for are things that are turn-based. Obviously, Into the Breach is a one-player game, but if you wanted to make a tactics game that was multiple players, you could easily do that with uh, the patterns that I'm going to bring up following this. It's also good for games like Mario 35 on the left here, or Tetris 99 you see on the right. These games will come up in a certain pattern that I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about another one called Anti-Ant, which is a game that I made for a game jam. It was just a week-long game jam, so you can imagine that even though these patterns are complex, they're not actually that difficult to implement. And so I really like to emphasize the fact that I use a lot of these in game jams and still end up finishing games. And another one is like Mario Maker. And this is one of the more dangerous patterns that I'll be mentioning. Probably Mario Maker doesn't do it the way I do it. But it is extremely useful for this type of game. And if you go look at Baby Hero Babysitter's Club, that's exactly the type of game that it is. So the first pattern I'm going to be mentioning is called I call it Mr. Game in Cloud. And I'm going to say, like the robot here, Danger, Will Robinson. And the reason for that is this is probably the most dangerous pattern I'm going to be mentioning. What you do is you store most of your game in the cloud. It doesn't have to be all of it, but for example, for Hero Babysitter's Club, every map is stored in the cloud. Now, in my case, that's just the data for the map. It's not the actual representation of it. But with, for example, Firebase Storage, you can store images, 
you know, sprites, sprite sheets, etc., backgrounds, whatever it happens to be. You can store sound assets, whether they be sound effects or full songs. You can store scripts, which you can add dynamically to nodes at runtime. And technically, you can even store pack files, which Godot uses to give you uh, relatively dynamic things and support for patches, which means you can store scenes in the cloud. I haven't actually gotten that to work yet, but it is possible. And some of the things that you have to do for this, uh, because they're extremely dangerous, you want to use hash codes a lot. Uh, one way of doing this is in Godot, you zip a directory, essentially, a list of files. And you put them together, and then you hash it. That hash you put into a manifest file. And then the manifest file, you also upload that to something like Firestore. And the zip file you upload to storage. Now, when you download it again, you rehash the file and check it versus the one in the manifest. That loosely ensures that the file that you downloaded is the one that you hashed originally. And because the manifest file is the thing storing it, it's a little bit harder for a hacker to man-in-the-middle attack the file itself. If you find you have a bad hash code, you just send it back or rather you send a notification that here clearly was an error that happened. Someone might be trying to hack this person. And then you could try re-downloading it or you could tell them like there's something wrong with your connection. Try getting on a secure connection. And as I mentioned, Hero Babysitter's Club is a pretty good example of this. Um, when I publish it, and I'm intending to publish it for the Switch, it will even have the ability to upload custom images from users. I've got uh, Google's Cloud Vision API set up so that when they upload an image, if it's completely inappropriate, it will just blur the image. And if it does that, I'll tell the game not even to load it and don't even load the asset that they've uploaded. This could be used for something as simple as user avatars or it could be you know, something really complex like I'm trying to do, which is build sort of widgets in game or hazards or you know change the look of the hero or whatever it happens to be the second pattern I'm going to be talking about I call it give an enemy take an enemy these are games like Mario 35 or Tetris 99 or even anti ant like I mentioned before these can be fairly dangerous depending on how you handle it and the idea is you send commands and data from one machine to the cloud. And then you distribute that to other players, and it's interpreted, and the players interpret the commands and data client-side on their machines. So this one is fairly easy to hack. You could uh, easily just say, well, I'll intercept the command that gets sent to me, and you know, do this, that, and the other thing. But since it's sort of real-time, you know, you're, you're getting commands as they come in, and making changes to the game on the fly, if they're doing those things, they're not paying attention to the game itself, which means it's very easy for them to just die for whatever reason. You know, let's say it's a platformer, which is what anti ant is as well. Um, if they're trying to manipulate it and make it so it doesn't hit them with lightning, an enemy might just come up and bonk into them and kill them. So I like to have this be... Um, you know, relatively fast games, not games where it's going to give them time to manipulate the data and change things. As you can see here, this is an actual bit of code in Godot from Anti Ant. And how I protect myself from a little bit of hacking is I alias all my actions. So as you can see here, I've got an action called Spawn Enemy. And I still use Call Group to go place this enemy into. A spawner and then whenever that spawner shows up on the screen it fires up the enemy and throws it at the player. Other things like starting the game over or just starting it in the first place these are things that are aliased by this action command and rather than allowing the operating system using call or even call group directly the data that I send up is handled in that way so that they can't just call functions directly on my code. 
Obviously, they can say, well, I'm going to go send a spawn enemy a bunch of times and kill all my opponents, but I figure that's probably less likely, again, due to the speed of the game itself, which is fairly, fairly fast. A third pattern I'll be talking about here are randomizers. This is actually a type of game that's gotten really popular recently. Not just Dragon Warrior, but there's plenty of other games right now that have this. These are games where they take a randomized seed and use that seed to build out the entire world that the player ends up playing in. Typically they're uh, sort of implemented on older games. Like I said, Dragon Warrior here is a good example. But this pattern is actually fairly safe. This one you probably won't run into too many problems with, and a lot of the reason is a lot of these games are streamed live on Twitch. And if they're doing that, and they, for example, change the seed that you've used or that you've sent them, then it's going to look completely different. And if it's being streamed live to prove that they're actually playing the same game, then it will just look very different from what everyone else has and they won't win the match because they'll just be disqualified. And the way that I would recommend implementing this is you have one main game, I'm calling it the host, that sends the random seed to the players in the tournament. And then that main program, this, the host, it can track the progress of the players too. You can have the players' apps send updates to the host pretty much directly. You just have the host listen in the JSON document database to where the update is being sent. And you don't have to have the players do it. So they never know where other players are at. And, you know, if you want, you can even have them, uh, you can have them update on their own thing if, uh, if you want to have it so they actually have, keep, they're keeping track of it themselves. But the nice thing about this is it can make it much easier for the casters themselves. If you've ever seen one of these tournaments, the casters often struggle trying to find out, you know, player 12 is this far along. Do they have the items they need to beat the game yet or not? Well, just by looking at one of 12 streams, for example, it's really hard to tell that. So if they're allowed to track things on a separate program that is getting all the data, it's much easier for them. And I think this is a highly untapped area for general games. Even though we've got, you know, roguelikes and so forth, they're not really done in this way for tournaments and stuff like this that um, are relatively discrete games with well-built mechanics and so forth but are designed to be beatable in a relatively easy amount of time. You know, a lot of the, the randomizers that I watch, they're only like, at most, like four-hour games. You're, you're usually not going to get ones that are much bigger than that. And so I highly recommend trying to make a randomizer or essentially a roguelike that sends data like this back and forth and then let your players build tournaments with it. Let them select the random seed or let the casters or whomever's running the host send the random seed out so that the players don't have to type it in. That way there's no mistakes. And I think your game will be pretty popular based on that. Now the fourth pattern is actually probably the most complex from an architecture standpoint. I couldn't think of any games that actually implement this. I have tried to. It's so difficult. I was going to make it for go.con just to um, try to show just what this is possible or just what is possible with this pattern but it's actually a bit too complicated I would need to take probably several months just to build out the architecture make sure everything works make sure everything is solid and get it to just run but I decided about part of the way through uh, making Hero Babysitter's Club to completely switch the type, switch the pattern that I'm using. I switched from a top-down RPG to the platformer that you see now, and it was a lot easier, frankly. So these types of games are highly dynamic. This is where, for example, you might have, let's say it's a game like Into the Breach, and except instead of 
maybe it's not even purely turn based maybe you have like an active turn timer for example on each player and that might run on their system you might run it on firebase's servers for example they have a thing called cloud functions that allow you to run node.js or typescript code in the cloud so when a thing comes in uh, for example, with Hero Babysitter's Club, you're allowed to name the map and put in a bunch of data. If you put in swear words, I have code that run, runs that automatically deletes those swear words from the text. So you can never put in anything that is too awful for it. With these semi-real-time games, though, you have to track everything. So you have to track player positions. That alone is fairly difficult, especially when you have to consider that when a player joins the game everyone else is already in the game so you have to get the most up-to-date individual values for them this type of game is not very good for the html export that you can have with godot and for example the firebase plugin and the reason for that is the html spec really for firebase only allows you to have about four to five I think it is connections at once so you don't want to you know accidentally overload that because people just won't get updates and then that's a problem so you want to use just normal games for this it'll work on mobile it'll work on you know iOS Android it'll work on Linux Windows Mac whatever other platforms you want just not HTML5 and this actually, the pattern that I use for this is almost the exact same as give an enemy, take an enemy. But because they can sort of interact, you sort of have to show everything that is being done on the screen. You don't necessarily have to show things like pop-ups that other players are experiencing. But things like, you know, when they kill an enemy, that enemy has to disappear on everyone's screen. It doesn't technically have to, but that would be sort of a smart way to do it and it would be the way that players would expect the game to go. So, as the fourth pattern goes, that's actually pretty much all I have um, today. If Remember, if you can help me get to a thousand subscribers, I will uh, create a tutorial to show you how to use all this stuff much more, you know, much more easily than you're probably realizing. The tutorial is going to be a long one. It'll be creating a full game. I'd just like to say thanks to you, Heartbeast, Jetski, Mr. Dobby, James Brody, the Go.Nets team, Nicolo Chuck, S.I. Silicon, and Luke, Fabio Alessandrelli for his constant work helping out, you know, with the HTML stuff, actually whole guiding the entire thing. He's done such a great job with it and has helped us out a lot on our team. And uh, the country of Latvia. I don't know why, but the Go.Nets Go team is really popular there, and we love that, so... Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good day and hope you enjoy the rest of the Go.com.
Hello everyone, my name is Ilaria Cislaghi and welcome to Godot VFX Crash Course. When we say VFX, we mean visual effect. Those powerful explosions that are there in games when you shoot your rockets, or those gentle sparkles that invite you to a hidden path. This is all the realm of VFXs. There are many different ways to do visual effects. Some people draw them hand by hand every frame. They make those animation like the one we see in the bottom right of the slide. Then when we want to do some more realistic visual effects, we might need to actually create simulation in certain programs like Blender or Houdini, and then export them as animations and bring them in engine. There's also another part of visual effects, which is what we do when we use particles in game. This is what we're gonna talk about today. But before we move right into the technicalities of the craft, we need to talk about the artistic principles behind visual effects. First of all, if we're doing something like an explosion or something that's really, really loaded with energy, we need to communicate something about this energy. Where is it concentrated? When is it concentrated? Where does it come from? And where does it go? In this image, you can see clearly where the energy is coming from how it's pushing the smoke away, how smoke is dissipating. I think that this concept really, really communicates very, very well all the motion of energy, even if it's a still image. So the way that we communicate all those things is through timing and motion. There are 12 principles of animation that they apply to VFX as well. In particular, anticipation is for when we um, communicate that something is about to happen. So even with very, very small fraction of a second motions, we can say, hey, something's gonna happen here. Then we want to talk about staging. We want to make sure that we concentrate the focus of our players in the place that matters the most, where things are happening. And once we make the player's focus on those parts, we can talk about secondary motion and secondary action. We can add a little, of things around our effects just to round up the whole thing and make it feel really as a whole big piece. Something that we also need to consider when doing timing and motion and animation in general and anything that's moving is to use good curves. You will notice when you use a linear curve, so just interpolate linearly from A to B, it's going to look a little bit off, a little bit odd, and which is why we want to use curves that look different. Another thing that I really, really like about animation is stretch and squash. So you can see in the image to the right, there's one ball that's stretching and squashing and the other one is not. And you can see how much that adds to the effect. So another way that we communicate the old important parts of an effect is by using colors. Computers look at colors as RGB alpha values in general, but we want to, what we want to talk about is hue, saturation, and value. This is just a different way of representing colors. So when we talk about value, we're talking about the brightness of a color, how close to pure white that is. Brightness is generally associated in humans with power and energy because when in nature, when something is very, very hot, it starts emitting light. So we're naturally drawn to think that when something is really, really bright, then it has to have a lot of heat and power. So once we concentrate our heat and power in a place, we can proceed with the secondary element, similar to secondary motions. This is something that goes together with the rest, so we can desaturate those secondary elements so that they don't draw too much attention, but they are still visible and still help make the effect feel whole and polished. One small trick that I find really interesting that you can see in the video at the bottom right is to shift the hue of your effect. It adds more depth to your effect. It makes it look more complete. As you can see, like the flame on the right, which is just blue from bright blue to less bright blue, you can see that it, it, it doesn't look bad, but the one to the left just has that tiny bit more that makes it look better. So now that we know pretty much what are the principles of it, we need to talk about how VFXs are a tool for gameplay. They don't live on their own. They could in your portfolio pieces, but VFXs are one of the biggest tools to communicate to players what's happening. So 
we need to ask ourselves a lot of questions when we make a visual effect. So what is the purpose? What am I communicating to the player? Am I communicating something positive? Am I communicating something negative? Is it an area effect? What area does it cover? Is it important that the player knows exactly what area does it cover? Like for example, if it's an area damage effect, I might want to communicate very, that very clearly so that the players can dodge it, can move out of the area. Similarly, if it's an effect that is going to travel in a direction, we might want to stage it in a way that we show which direction this effect is going to travel beforehand. And then something a little bit more technical and less fun, like how many effects will I have on screen? Are those effects going to obstruct important information? Like, as, are my effects too big? Do they take away too much space? And lastly, this is really sad to think about when you're a visual effect artist because you want to make everything wonderful, bright, uh, with a lot of different particles and parts to it, but then you're making a mobile game. So maybe you cannot just throw as many particles as you would like in an effect. So you have to scale it down a little bit. So those are all the questions that we need to ask ourselves when we do a visual effect. Now, if we're just starting out, it's very important to think about what are the established languages and finding reference for those. We said that visual effects are a tool to communicate something to the player. So if you want to communicate, we need to have an established language. I think that Kalinu made a fantastic job with this effect. This is a healing effect for the VFX challenge that we had in the Godot VFX server. And I find it like really on the spot. It has all those nice particles that gives a whimsical effect. Then you have a, a clear area where the effect is happening. And at the bottom, you can see those swirls, those circles that communicate protection. They are very, very well done. And this uses all languages that have been established in game already and we are all familiar with. Now that we spoke about the artistic principles for this, we can talk about the technical tools. I personally work with open source software. I'm here with Godot and uh, I do my particles inside of Godot. I do modeling in Blender for when I need meshes. And for texture, I use a variety of different tools because they all offer different things. In particular, I do most of my textures, my dissolved texture, I mix them with Krita. But sometimes when I want to make an animation, a hand-drawn animation, I might use OpenTunes, Tahoma 2D, which is a fork of OpenTunes with a little bit more advanced vector tools, or Blender with a grease pencil. It's really, really cool. Go check it out. It's really fun to use. So once we speak about external tool, we can also talk about what Godot offers us to make VFX. First of all, particles, particles, particles. We're going to use a lot of particles when we make VFXs. They are the backbone of what makes VFXs awesome. Then we have the animation players, which is a node in Godot that allows you to keyframe different properties of different objects. And it's really, really powerful. You can keyframe a lot of things with the animation player. You can even keyframe properties of the animation player. Don't do that. Weird thing happen. But this is a really, really powerful tool. As you can see in the image on the right, I am keyframing properties of a material. I'm keyframing whether or not particles are emitting. I am keyframing translation and scale of a mesh. So there are a lot of different things that you can do with the animation player. Then of course, we might need meshes. We might need multi-meshes, although that's a more rare case. And did I mention particles? When we talk about particles, we talk also about meshes, and this is specific for 3D effect. We need to think about whether or not the tool that we want to use is good for the job. So at the bottom left, you can see there's this ice shield that's in the beginning is water, then it condenses into ice and then it melts again. So this is done with the mesh. Meshes come with a variety of different things that they support. For example, they support skeletal animation. You can control them with the animation player. They support shape keys, which is what is changing the shape of this mesh, the way it changes the shape is basically by having three different shape keys, one for when it's water, one for when it's ice, and one for when it melts in a puddle. And all of those are keyframed with an animation player. The only downside of using meshes really is that materials need to be unique if you are keyframing the properties of a material, because the way Godot does resources, it tries to share materials as much as possible. So if you do keyframe the properties of a material, if the material is shared, shared with other meshes, then you're just going to see things change on all the meshes. So we need to make materials unique, which means that Godot has to draw more things overall. 
This is something that does not happen with particles. All the particles within an effect can share the same material. And also, if we want to have multiple effects that are use the same particle system and the same material, that's fine because what really, really drives the particles and the properties that change of the particle, it's done internally by Godot, so we don't need to worry about that. Particles also come with a lot of quantity and a good randomization, which is something that otherwise we had to script ourselves if we were using meshes directly. The only downside of using particles that I can think of, aside from their performance cost on certain platforms, is that everything that happens in a particle is lifetime relative, meaning that if you want to change the scale of your particles, you don't change it over an absolute amount of time, you have to change it over the particle's lifetime. So if I have an effect that lasts three seconds and I want a flash particle to be the biggest as second one, then I need to, to put the, um, the part where the particle is bigger at one third of its lifetime. But if then I change the lifetime from three to two, one third of two is not one third of three. So in order to resynchronize the flash with the rest, I will need to change the curves as well. Another very important tools when doing effect are shaders. I know that a lot of people are scared of shaders. I understand that. They are magic, but they're also a lot, a lot of fun to do. As you can see in the image at the bottom, you can turn a mesh that looks like that into those wind gusts that just come and go. This is all animated with the, an animation player, just keyframing certain properties of a material. So shaders can do a lot of things, but thanks to a lot of community resources that we have, you don't need to be able to write shaders in order to make good looking visual effects. Remember the healing effect from Kalinu that does not use any custom shader. So we have resources, don't be intimidated. You don't need to start learning shaders in order to start doing visual effects. That said, Godot offers something very, very special, which is a particle shader, which is a special type of shader that does not define how particles look, but they define how they move. So we can define the transform of a particle, the velocity, we can also define the color there, and we can define a custom data that we can pass from the particle shader to the shader that then is going to display those particles. At the bottom right, you can see, this is a clip from a game that I'm working on called The Nest. This is rain is made entirely with a particle shader. The collisions are done inside of a particle shader by using the secondary texture that holds collision information. And the, those bubbles that, that appear on the ground they are driven entirely by the particle shader. This just uses a canvas material with particle animation enabled, and that's it. So particle shader can do incredible things. They can communicate with the actual canvas or spatial shader that then you put on your mesh or sprite. They do it through this custom property and they are really, really powerful. It's a little bit of an unknown feature of Godot, but it's really, really awesome. So now that we've seen the artistic principle and all the tools that we will need to do VFX, I made this effect for this presentation and I'm going to show you how it's done. First of all, I gathered references. That's really important, especially when you're starting out, but also later on, you really want to have an idea of what you're doing. For me in particular, I wanted to make a hit slash a blast effect and I wanted to theme it around prismatic light. So first of all, I've been, I went searching for reference for hit effects. I found the one that you see at the bottom left. It looks really, really nice. It has a lot of very interesting shapes that you will see in the other effects as well. So it has this outer ring. It has those tiny sparks that come out. It has distortion at the back. And it also has the streak that come out from the center and cut the circle. I really, really liked the whole setup of this effect. On the right, I chose this effect because it really communicates the theme of light really see how the author had light in mind. You have all those bright particles going around and it's those colorful parts of it that really, really communicates this is light, this is energy, this is, comes from pure light. So after they gathered all the references, I went on and made a concept for this effect. So this is like three stages. So at the top right, you can see the part when it winds up, then the moment of the explosion, and then the part where the energy dissipates. What I knew is that I wanted to, in each part of the effect, each element had to communicate what this VFX was about. And this VFX is about prismatic light. 
What I also decided to do was to go for a medium speed effect, so a little bit slower than what you normally see in a game like League of Legends. This is more an effect that you can expect in an MMO, in a fantasy MMO. But what I did want to do is to communicate exactly the moment when the power is concentrated, the moment where the effect explodes. So after doing the concept, I moved on to drawing my texture from left to right. There's the glow, there's those particles for the sparks, those, those streaks that we will see later. Then there's the circular blast and this halo of rainbow energy to the right. I also have a texture that then I did not use because I didn't really think it fit in the effects after I tried using it. So I wanted to include it anyway to show that not everything goes as planned when we're doing VFX. That's absolutely normal and being receptive to feedback is very, very important. After making the concept, after drawing texture, I started assembling the particle, figuring out exactly which particle system I wanted to have. And this is all done using Godot's default particles material. I did not write any special particle shader. I did, however, use my shader that I have done made in the past to do particles. It's downloadable, you can get it later. And one single custom shader for the shockwave. I've used the animation player to drive the animation and most particles use additive blend mode and unlit. The unlit part is really important when using additive because sometimes you don't want them to be unlit, but if you do want them to be unlit and then you forget to put them unlit, you're going to have things that start looking weird, a little bit washed out, and it's going to hard, be hard to figure out exactly why that's happening. The main part of this VFX is this main globe particle. This is a single particle, and this drives the whole pacing of the effect. It does the part where the effect collects energy and the part where the energy is released. So everything should follow what this particle does. This is a billboard quad, so it's a quad that is facing always towards the camera and it uses proximity fade, which is a technique that we use when we don't want geometry badly intersecting within one another. As you can see in the image in the center, this does not use proximity fade, so you can really see when this quad is intersecting with the ground. Proximity fade instead fades out your particle when it's close to opaque geometry. It only works with opaque geometry because it reads the depth buffer. And it could be a little bit expensive. It's not incredibly important, but it really adds to the polish of the whole effect. On the right, you can see how I keyframed my curve and how I, I set up my gradient. The brightest part of the gradient happens exactly in the middle of the effect when this particle is expanding and reaching close to its biggest size very, very fast. The next particle system is possibly my favorite particle system of this effect. This is used to show people where the energy is collecting to draw the eye really towards the center of this hit effect, this blast. And this is a fully 3D particle system. It uses 3D meshes and it uses the hue shift property of the process material of particles. As you can see, some particles, they have slightly different colors, but they all share the same texture. And this is done through using the hue shift inside of the particle that Godot offers us. So this is how the swirls look without the shader on them. The way that I achieve this effect in space is to enable a line Y flag for the particles, to set the spread to 180, and then give it a very, very small initial velocity. This is, is enough for Godot to decide which side the particle should be facing. So after we did the particle, there's the part regarding the material. This is a fairly known technique. We're just sliding a texture by moving the UV of the mesh. So what's particular about this mesh is that it has UVs that are unwrapped on a space that's actually bigger than the zero one space vertically. As you can see from the repeating, they take three times the space. So they don't go from zero to one, but they go from zero to three. And then with the shader, the UVs are made to slide and only the texture that is going to be in the zero one window will be displayed. And this is done by using the no repeat property when importing a texture, because if we don't disable repeating, you will see what you see at the bottom right. So the, we see more than the texture because by default, the texture is just tiled 
when the UVs go above zero and one. But if we disable repeat, we're just going to see one and it's going to slide across the mesh. The next particle system uses a single particle. This is a blast particle. It's very, very simple. It's the circle that then it fades away. But the particular thing about it is how it fades away. Alpha erosion is a known technique and it's based on giving a secondary texture to your particle that drives how the particle dissipates. So you can see on the right, we have this texture with those white dots and white parts. Those are the parts that will dissipate last. And you can see at the bottom right in the animation, the difference between on the right using alpha erosion, on the left, just the normal multiply of a particle. So when we do erosion textures, there's a neat trick that I learned, which is check the color histogram of your erosion texture. It will tell you how balanced it is, where there will be most erosion. My histogram does not look great. As you can see on the left, there's a lot of color concentrated there, but I was fine with it. It has to look nice. It doesn't have to be perfect. The next particle is the shockwave particle. This uses a custom shader. It has the same timing as the blast. This has to be unlit, not additive, because otherwise this would be shaded and we will see that we're reading the screen. And what's really important with this particle is the rendering order. Because this particle has to read the screen texture in order to do this distortion, we need to render it before anything else because the screen texture only contains opaque objects. So everything that's alpha, everything that's transparent, is not going to show in the screen texture. And on the right, you can see I put the render priority very high, so it draws on top of everything. And you see what the problem is. It's completely making everything else go away. But the most common case is that Godot is just not going to know which one to draw first. So I might draw it as a second or third particle. So your particle that uses screen reading material is just going to hide the two or three particles and your effect is going to look weird and it's going to be hard to figure out why. So if you use materials that read from the screen texture, be very, very mindful of the rendering order. It can be set at the bottom of the property of a material. As you can see in the image on the left, I set minus 100, just the lowest priority that you can give to a material. Then we have the sparks particle. These are fairly standard particles. It's an outwards burst, so it starts from the center and goes towards the outside with some velocity. What is interesting about this one is that it actually uses a texture atlas, and the texture has motion blur baked in the texture, which makes it look blurry even if you take a still image of this effect. So in order to use a texture atlas, Godot offers us the animation property of the process material. The animation property can be used to animate a flipbook, but it can also be used to just select between different textures. So as you can see on the right, I have this texture. And by setting the offset to one and the offset random to one, Godot is just going to pick one of those four parts of this texture to display for each particle. So some particles will have the longer parts, some particles will have the very small one, and we will have some variation within the same particle system. Then we have the rainbow streaks particles. They use a texture atlas as well as the previous one. They use alpha erosion, have we seen for the blast particle. What's interesting about this one is that the quad has the origin at the bottom. So on the left, you can see how the quads look like. This is a billboard particle with a random angle. And what allows them to go outwards is, is their pivot of the quad being at the bottom. Then you can see the slowdown effect on the right, how the dissolve makes the streaks dissolve from the center to the outside. The last particle of this effect is a rainbow ring particle. It's one single particle billboard as well. It has a lot of color. And because it has a lot of color, very saturated, saturated color, I just put the alpha very, very low. So this is barely visible. It adds to the whole effect, but it does not take too much of the pe people's attention away from the center of the effect. And we're done. This is how effect looked like in the beginning of the slides. And I think that now that you see how it's made, you can appreciate all the different parts that compose this effect. So in conclusion, I really want to spend two words on new, new Godot 4 features that are coming. We have decals, which are 
nodes are used to project texture on other surfaces. Those are really, really useful for when we want to put a crack on the ground or bullet holes in a wall. Decals will come with Godot 4. It will enable more things. I'm super, super happy that we're getting those. Then we're getting a lot of more particle features. In particular, the contributor Chaosus89 made this fantastic custom nodes for the visual particle shaders, which allows us to make particle shaders way more easily. I hope that more people will pick them up because they are so fun to work with. They add so much to your game and I'm super, super excited. We're also getting ribbon trails, we're getting particle collisions, we're getting sub emitters. So I really can't wait to play around with Godot 4. If you like this talk and if you got more interested into visual effects, which I hope you did, we have a dedicated Godot focused community for visual effects. We have a Discord server, we have Twitter. And if you want to start out on VFX, we have monthly challenges, which are the perfect entry point to give you a little bit of inspiration on what to work and what to try out next. Thank you very much for attending this talk. If you have questions, and I expect you might have some since this was a lot of content, you can reach me on Twitter and on Discord. I am super happy to answer questions about visual effects and to try and give feedback however I can. Have a nice day and happy GodoCon. Bye. Hi, thanks for joining me here at Godot.com. I'm very excited to do this presentation. 
So in this talk, we are going to see uh, this project I worked on where I mixed my favorite functional programming language, which is Clojure, with Godot in order to improve my animation workflow. So more specifically, we are going to see a very brief introduction to how animation works in 3D games. Then we'll talk about the relationship between the animation trees and functional languages, so how I map those together. And then we'll see this custom domain-specific language uh, that I made to improve my animation workflow by letting me reuse code and build better abstractions for animation. To start, first, a uh, few words about me. Uh, I'm a PhD student and researcher at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. And there I've been working with these uh, bad boys you see here, which are BPM and process models. And well, I, I always try to bring uh, some of my work to my hobbies and vice versa. And so basically, uh, this is what inspired me for my current project, which is a game called The Process, where basically I took this uh, more serious idea of the processes we are working on and applied it uh, to a fun game where you basically build and enact your processes in a colorful, cheerful world. So I'm doing this with Godot, and particularly I've been enjoying a lot the native Rust integration for this. It's been very useful to work on the factory mechanics and all those things. So the talk is not specifically about my game, but please feel free to check out um, more things about it at, uh, at Play the Process on Twitter. On to the presentation. Animation in 3D games is basically uh, basically consists of skeletal animation, most of it. And this is where a character, uh, which is a mesh of vertices, is animated uh, via skeleton. So you have the bones drive the mesh and, and perform the animation. So we, what you can see here is a, is a simple animation clip I worked on for my main character in, in Blender. And so you basically work on the keyframes and you get interpolation and things like that. So th this is what you have in your 3D software, basically a bunch of short animation clips that then you need to uh, sort together and compose them to make the final game. So this is what you do with the game engine, typically like Godot. Here, as you can see, Godot helps you with these uh, animation trees to compose your animations. And here you can see a very simple example, which is blending. You have a speed parameter here uh, in a blend function and then it, this takes two parameters, which are basically two animations, which are uh, idle and run. And you can tell how much of each animation goes into the mix, which is here in the output. And so you can get a smooth transition from idle to running. I didn't make any of the in-between animations. I just did the idle cycle and the run cycle and, and the engine figures out the rest. And for the most part, uh, you can get pretty nice results with something like this. So uh, this is traditionally how most 3D animation is, is being done. So the problem becomes that characters in games can do a lot of things. And when organizing animations, that can get into a bit of a mess. Uh, let me show you that with an example. Uh, so uh, you could have your character just idling around, doing nothing, or then uh, just running or jumping. And then you go on to more game-specific mechanics, like grabbing stuff from the floor, and then you decide that you also want to add animals like chicken, and then you need to grab those as well. And you may think that these two last animations are something that could be organized in a sort of a state machine. So you have the basic locomotion tree, like the first three animations I've shown you, which need to blend well together. But then you don't need to blend those together with grabbing from the floor, because this is something that happens independently in a separate state. And this is a very clear and nice way of organizing things. But the problem then becomes that maybe you want to add a feature where you can uh, run with a chicken on your hands and then suddenly grabbing and running around kind of become the same thing and then need to go into the same tree because you can also do things like camping uh, or everything you were able to do before, now you can do with a chicken on your, on your arms uh, and this becomes sort of a combinatorial explosion. And then uh, you decide that you want to add a grappling hook to your game and if you compose things in just the right way, then uh, emerging gameplay comes up and you grab a chicken with your grappling hook and everything works together kind of nicely. I, I won't say perfectly, but, but then it, the blends do a, a good job on themselves so you can quickly prototype things. 
the problem though with everything I've shown you is that animation trees get really complex because you are starting to mix things like uh, grabbing or specific animations into the main locomotion tree, but then you also have sort of satellite states and uh, everything gets kind of messy. So the problem with that uh, is that at some point, uh, which is pretty much at the GIF that you are seeing now, uh, I kind of gave up. I said, uh, I cannot add more complexity to these trees. It's getting too tedious. So I, I looked for a solution. And basically the, the, what you will see in this talk is what I come up with. So that got me thinking. There were some issues that were kind of specific, some kind of missing features, let's say. But then there, there were some things that were bothering me with animation trees that were uh, kind of inherent to a visual language. And that got me thinking on visual languages versus textual languages. Uh, and basically, why do I use a textual language everywhere else? So visual languages are pretty good because they show the data flow at a glance. Uh, you can see where things are going just by following the arrows. And they are more intuitive to non-programmers, especially uh, artists like to play around with uh, node graphs. And then you can also go beyond the linear structure of code. So in text files, you cannot escape the fact that you are on a linear array of characters. So you get one function, another function, another function, and, and, and you need to parse your files sequentially and organize them in a, in a rigid tree structure that is a file system with folders. But visual languages can go beyond that. They can show you your data. Uh, they can hide things when they are not relevant. You can navigate things in a more uh, interactive way. And, and I like that a lot about visual languages. But for this specific use case, I was looking more of, uh, about the properties of textual languages. So basically, uh, textual languages help me build better abstractions. The basic building block in every programming language, which is a function, I can write a function and which takes a set of parameters and suddenly I parameterized my code in a very simple way. Uh, we also have a keyboard driven interaction, which is something that I, I appreciate a lot. Uh, it, basically, it's, it's, uh, it's impossible to be productive with a visual language without your mouse and pointing around with the mouse is a bit more cumbersome and difficult than just typing. So textual languages for me get that point. And also layout is not so much of an issue with textual languages because we have uh, automatic indenting tools that work perfectly and we don't need to worry about it anymore. With that in mind, I started thinking, and as I said before, I, I like to bring things from my work to my hobbies like game development. And uh, I, I started thinking that, uh, okay, animation trees are starting to look very much like a functional language. And I said, what I want to do is just apply more of the high level patterns that I'm used to work when working with a textual high level functional programming language, just like Clojure, which is what I use at work. So then that con kind of got me thinking, on, okay, uh, this is sort of like a function and these are input parameters. So if we do squint a little, then we can start seeing this and then we can convert our uh, visual tree into a mathematical-ish formula which uh, basically we define the output in terms of a function of inputs and we realize that our animation tree is just a, comp a huge composition of functions and and that's very nice because then uh, we already got the tools to handle this kind of thing uh, because we we got languages uh, programming languages and particularly Functional programming languages are very good at this sort of thing. So that's what I set out to build. I started thinking and I said, okay, let's build a domain specific language for this to make my animations. And then we, I will get functions. I will get copy and paste. I will get better abstractions. And, and I'm going to do that with Clojure. And that's because it's the tool that I know the most for this sort of job of building a small compiler. And that, that's basically why I used it. There's nothing specific to Clojure uh, apart from it being an awesome language, which is a modern Lisp implementation that uh, runs on the JVM, but also in other platforms. And it's a functional language by design, but that does not mean it's a very academical, impractical one. Uh, they take the pragmatic approach and they make things like side effects uh, effortless if you really need the, to do them uh, while making things like immutable data structures very, very convenient to use. Uh, so the DSL I came up with looks pretty much something like this. 
this is a notation that in, in closure land uh, we call hiccup uh, because it's the, um, it's the first library that uh, implemented this sort of idea and it's very simple actually so uh, you have uh, a vector of parameters and each of the positions in this vector uh, means a kind of a different thing so the first thing uh, on the vector is the operator name and that would be like a blend to one shot time scale or all the operators in an animation tree that we are uh, used to working with then we get a dictionary with parameters uh, let's say that we have a parameter called speed then it will go here and then finally we have the children and the children which are arbitrarily nested so you could place other operators here are the inputs and this is where you kind of write it backwards just like the function expression uh, before so uh, I think it's best if we look at this with an example so this is our blend uh, tree from before and this is how we write them in this DSL uh, so basically we have a, a blend to node a parameter which is a speed which is what you would see here and then uh, its inputs uh, or its children, depending on how you look at it, are two animations, which are the idle loop and the run loop. So writing something like this, you can get uh, a tree like this. And, and this is the language I've been working on. So let's look at this example. So here we are seeing our character, which has two different kinds of run. One for when they're holding the weapon and the other for when they're not. And so... Um, you need to blend those together but you also get a, a, a different blend which is the one that we were seeing before so we kind of got a, a two-way blend we have speed on one hand and the combat mode let's call it on the other hand and uh, then uh, trees uh, grow because you need to handle each combination uh, separately if you had three weapons then you would have three more these kind of structures here combined with more and more blends let's say nesting them together one by one and with something like this uh, you can write things in a, in a more succinct way so you create this speed here this is a function that basically creates this structure it takes two parameters which are the idle and run animations and then wraps them together on a blend node with the parameter called speed and then uh, we have a second blend here, which is the combat mode, which just takes two uh, identical but parameterized speed subtrees uh, as inputs. And with this, we have built this abstraction. But there is another point here that I realized that uh, something that was also getting a bit cumbersome when animating was that, okay, now I had to duplicate some, some blends because I would like to use this same speed here for this but and just change a single parameter but I can't because I really need to separate those two into, into separate trees and to fix that uh, what I uh, realized is that I can link these two uh, speed parameters together uh, just by calling them with the same name this is something that's not supported by Godot but is supported in my DSL so uh, I can do this and then get a, a setter function where I set speed and it sets speed for the two blend nodes at the same time. So here I would need extra code made manually for each of the um, for each of these link parameters, and I can implement that if I have my own language myself. So that's very nice and another very nice addition to this language, I believe. And so finally, I set out to build this uh, idea and make it real and. Well, this is pretty much the, the structure I ended up with. I wrote a compiler in Clojure, which generates GDScript code. And then I run it with Godot to generate both an animation tree and an animation controller. So the animation tree is just uh, what you are used to seeing. And the animation controller is this uh, tiny script where you get getters and setters for the parameters that uh, handle the linking feature I just described. And so uh, I, I think it would be best if we look at this with real examples. So let me show you this uh, scene I built in Godot, uh, which is my main character for my game and uh, everything that comes with it. And as you can see here, we have this, well, uh, this is not working right now because the animation tree root is missing. It has nothing in it. So we are going to generate that using my DSL language and then we are going to load it uh, into this character so you can see it in action. 
And so um, what you can see here is a very short script uh, using Clojure. I call it a DSL, but this is just plain regular Clojure code. It's just that it makes it very convenient to write uh, in these sort of custom syntaxes. And so what I'm doing here is basically, as you were seeing before, we have a speed function and then a combat mode, which blends between two identical sets of idle or run animations, one with the weapon and one without the weapon. I compose everything on the main tree, which basically compiles the whole thing. And then I write this into a file, which is this uh, run weapon blend.gd. So this is compiled into a GD script file, as we, you will see in a moment. So in Clojure, we are used to doing this thing where we run code directly from our editor, and we call this a REPL. And so here, for example, let me show you that very simple stuff. I put uh, add together two numbers and get results. Or more interestingly, I could invoke this speed function with, uh, with values A and B. And you will see that what the uh, what the speed function is doing is just uh, wrapping those in a vector and adding the speed parameter to them. So if you build this combat mode, you will see uh, here I've got my variable inspector. You have this uh, first argument, which is the blend tool, which is this here. And then uh, this is the combat mode blend, as you can see on the second argument. And then you have recursively two other blends. This is the first one. And you can see a speed parameter and two regular run animations. So if I just run this thing here, you can see, well, it did nothing because it created the file, but the function did not return anything. That's why you saw that nil there. But if we look at this, run weapon blend file let me just make text a bit bigger so if, if we look at this file you will see that this is the auto generated code we have a static function at the beginning called generate and what this does is basically create the animation tree and return it so uh, and it does that by using regular tv scripts so you can do all you see here itself it's just that it's very tedious code so it makes a lot of sense to generate it automatically and well, here at the end, it just uh, returns the, the final result. And it also generated these two getter and setter functions for us. The getter for speed just returns the parameter for this speed blend value. It doesn't matter which one because they are linked. They will always have the same value because when you use the set speed, it sets both at the same time. And so. If we get back to Godot, uh, we can use this uh, gen animation tree tool. I need to set a script for it. Okay, so this is our script that we just generated and we can load it and you can see it here on the inspector. And uh, basically now uh, I have this uh, parent node, which is just a, a very, very simple tool script. And when I execute this, uh, you have you didn't see anything basically but if we go here on the animation tree you will see that uh, all of a sudden our tree has been compiled and inserted into the character and here i can activate the tree and hopefully everything works yeah so you can see that the character is now in its uh, idle state and why is that because the speed parameters are uh, at zero and the very next thing is that, as you can see, I got automatic layout because I also generate a uh, layout uh, for the tree using an algorithm, which is a uh, hierarchical structuring. And, uh, and then that allows me to play with the parameters. So basically, I can use this bit here and play around with it interactively. So I, I've got my textual DSL, but I also got uh, all the nice things from working on the visual UI. Uh, here, then, you, we can use the combat blend at the end. And as we can see, we get a very nice blending between the two animations. And if I just uh, actually show the weapon, you can see how it's working now. So this is basically the, um, the tool I've built. Let me just get back very quickly to the presentation. And so... You, conclude these presentations, we've seen uh, how, well, uh, animation trees are great, but they lack the abstraction mechanisms that we've got to know and love from our programming languages. And that's because, uh, partly because uh, a visual language has, 
has it more difficult to build these sort of attractions. And we realized along the way that we can look at animation trees as functional programming languages. And, and that's very nice because then we can use a, a, an actual functional programming language like Clojure to do very nice things and reuse a lot of codes uh, to generate animation trees. And this is one thing I, I got myself that I, I love functional programming style, but it's very difficult to fit it into game development because games are huge state mutation machines. So you are constantly mutating variables and that doesn't play uh, really well with functional programming where you basically cannot uh, change the value of a variable. Functional programming languages are great at processing uh, large amounts of data and doing that uh, efficiently, but not in the way that a game would require. So I, I like this sort of experiment because it allows me to bring the joy of programming in these sort of languages into the world of game development by building these uh, satellite tools that can help you improve the maintainability of your code base. And, and, and that's very nice because it allows us as functional programming zealots to, to bring some of our things to game development world. And so on a note, just to, to finish this, it could make sense for a tool like this to be uh, worked on for Godot. And I would be very happy to work on something like this. I, I'm interested in hearing about the feedback and just for the record, uh, so closure is not required for any of this. Uh, this could have been built just as uh, well in GDScript. It's just that I'm very familiar with closure and it was way easier for me to build this and prototype this with closure. But of course, if there's interest with something like this, message me and we can discuss the, the details. If you'd like to see something like this and sort of work on something like this with the projects. So with all that being said, uh, thank you very much for joining me in this presentation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the awesome talks that are about to come in this Godot phone. So thank you very much.
Hi everyone, my name is Marcos and I will be talking about trying to make a 3D racing game with Godot, my experience so far making Trackmaster. Trackmaster is a physics based sandbox and racing game. The idea is that you can choose a wide and quite unusual variety of vehicles and tracks. The game is not a simulator but because of the physics, it's also very skill-based. A little bit about myself first, I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. My full-time job is a geologist. I work with engineering projects like highways and railways, and I am 34 years old. I began development around January 2020, so it's around one year and a half by now. Right now it's already published in ITIO and in the Steam. So I have the idea for this game around December 2019, after I went to a Monster Jam event, and uh, it was really a very nice, very awesome experience to see in the stadium all those huge vehicles with those extremely loud engine sounds and the crowd reacting to every maneuver the, the drivers were making. And around, I think, January 2020, I took the decision to actually finish a game and see if I could could sell it, see if someone could buy it, not because of trying to make money, but to really make a game that's interesting and fun and see if other people that are not friends or family could have an interest in it and, and try to play it. So, and also it would be an uh, external way of measuring if I had success in making a game or not, because it's very easy for you to uh, just let go about uh, your plans if it's just yourself. And since the Monster Jam that I watched in the stadium was a very recent event, at that time I thought that it would be nice to make a racing game that when you play you look like you are in the stadium watching down all the vehicles in the field and that would make sense to make a simple game because I would not have to deal with camera angles and it was very interesting because I think in like three to four days I had a, a proper prototype working. Since the beginning I wanted all the vehicles to behave not in a realistic way but in a way that uh, you would expect because of the physics. So each vehicle has its own weight, acceleration, turning radius, drive type and handling. And I wanted since the beginning that every collision, every interaction could be unique due to the physics. The suspensions, the way that each vehicle turns. I tried in the beginning the vehicle body and vehicle wheels note from Godot, but I think that at that time, unfortunately, there was no per wheel steering and I think no per wheel acceleration. The wheels keep entering the ground and it was not interesting because I wanted the monster trucks with huge wheels and those huge wheels, it was very easy to see when they, the wheels were entering the ground, so it was no good and I I wanted per wheel steering and then different acceleration, all that stuff. So I began to experiment with different things and I find out about joints and the six DOR joints. Looking at the documentation, I saw that there was spring motors and I thought it would be very nice. And about in two to three days, I had a prototype working and it was already fun enough to play. The vehicle felt like it had some weight to it. The suspensions were working. I had steering working nicely and acceleration the vehicle could do some tweaks and some stunts uh, basically the setup that i came up about the physics of the vehicle it's mostly the same to today i just made some adjustments and i was actually quite surprised by six dof joints because they are very flexible the angular motors springs and linear limits angular limits they not only serve the purpose of vehicles but basically everything that is a movable part in any game any moving part in the vehicles not just the wheels but the bumpers and the doors are all attached to the main body by six DOF joints and since I wanted a very physics based game everything is a rigid body the main vehicle body the wheels so that there are no constraints imposed by code or anything else in how each vehicle each moving part would behave dealing with physics in every game I think it's always very difficult because there are no rules or 
how to do what you want to do so it's a lot of experimentation lots of going back and forth and trial and error and uh, even today when i will start a new vehicle i have to go back to that prototype of just box and cylinder if i am sure that it's working at the way i want then after that i go to the phase of actually looking for 3d models so working in 3d godot so far has been very nice i think that uh, if i was working in an engine like unreal probably i would have better visuals no doubt about it but probably i wouldn't have been able to make the game i have today it's not a complex game it's not a, a game with lots of content for me, I consider it's a lot of stuff. If I had to use another engine, probably there would be not even close to the point I am today. So thanks to Godot that with GD script that is a very easy to learn language, which with the fact that Godot allows anyone to prototype a lot of ideas and different approaches, I think that is very important when you are just by yourself trying to make a game and you can see very fast if your ideas are going to work or not so i think this is very nice about working with 3d in general one idea that i had in the beginning was that i would not try to model everything in the game make the 3d models although i can make 3d models in blender i knew from the beginning that trying to model every vehicle would be very time consuming and my intention was not to make every aspect of the game but to have a game done i already knew that there were websites like blank swap and sketchfab where you could have creative commons zero license and very good 3d models and i could just take the 3d models give credits to the authors of course and modify the models so that they would fit the looking that i was searching for the game so i think it that approach nowadays is very good for 3D. So looking forward to the next things I want to make in the game. Trying to make the graphics looking better, but I'm not spending much time with this because I'm focusing more on the gameplay and the contents of the game. But uh, graphics for sure is one area that I will look forward to improve. Online multiplayer probably I will be doing that this year. Another aspect that I think it's very fun in Godot is the same way that it's easy easy to prototype, it's easy to try different aspects of the game like split screen. I made split screen very early in the, into the development so I could play it with my 8 year old son. We had a lot of fun since the beginning, it was very interesting and it was a factor that made me believe that the game could be finished and it, it could be a fun game. So at the same time that dealing with physics is hard, it's difficult, it's lots of trial and error, at the same time it's fun to experiment and try because Godot allows very fast development cycles and test of ideas so if some approach for physics is very buggy it's very easy to try another approach and, and switch the models and switch the, the scenes and the nodes that you are using and compare them and, and see if they are working or not so play testing with physics even if it's sometimes frustrating I think that most of the time is actually fun and to conclude to finish my presentation I think that I am in the process of achieving the goal that I have set to myself in the beginning to finish a game and to publish it right now the game is being sold at each IO and in the Steam store page. Some people are leaving positive reviews, are interacting in the forums, are asking for more features. So I think it's been nice till now and I think that I am very close to not finishing the game but to achieve the goal of having a game that people are finding fun to play and people are interested in the game. So I think that's it and thank you everyone. I will be online in the chat to talk to everyone after the presentation. Bye bye. Why do we tell code beginners to learn Python first? People come to Godot and they just want to make games, but with a lack of a great hands-on programming course, we turn them away to go learn the basics elsewhere. Yes, yes, I know. We have free tutorials covering some Godot scripting syntax and features. At GDQuest, we even make our fair share. However, nothing available right now covers what absolute beginners need. Nobody really caters to these people, so every day we see newcomers who struggle so hard with the existing tutorials out there. We're talking about people who don't know how to code at all here. In the community, we typically recommend one of two things to beginners. One is you should start with another programming language. 
that's not ideal. Another is just use Godot. That does not work because it doesn't take people into account. Godot may be easy for you after years using it, yet overwhelming to a teenager who's never written a line of code. I keep seeing beginners who get stuck on the very first day. They keep banging their head at Godot because it's such a powerful tool and a complex one as a result. In the official docs, we opted for the first advice, to start with another language. It's because there's the excellent Harvard CS50 course out there that's free and we unfortunately don't have anything that's as good for Godot. Except that doesn't work. We still see people fail time and time again online. Many don't want to go learn another language because all they want is to learn to make games with Godot, here and now. And if all you want is to make games, you'll turn to another engine that teaches you just that, especially when those engines claim to be no code. You could get started right away. That's really appealing for users and why we see so many tools like these thrive. For years, I approach online teaching as if students were locked in a classroom and would have to go through all the classes. That works for some people, but not for others, as online, people easily quit because you lack the group pressure to motivate you and a teacher to support you. Here's what people want and what works online. Beginners want a shortcut. They want to learn hands-on, creating cool things from the start. They also want to understand everything, why we could this or that way, how every keyword and function works. They want to get results fast and go in-depth at the same time, which is um, contradictory. But see, as tutors, we're here to empower people and help them make games with Godot. We have to listen to what people need and teach the way that works for them. Otherwise, many will quit. If we can achieve that, that's more users and growth for Godot. Everyone wins. We can achieve that with a clever mix. So how do you reconcile people's contradictory desires with balance. Usually in tutorial series, we show how to create complete games step by step and from scratch. It's overwhelming for beginners as you keep piling on new concepts and features. They can follow along as they can copy what you're doing, but when left alone with their project, they are really likely to get stuck because they didn't have time to digest all the concepts and features they need. We can do better than that. Instead of teaching how to make complete games, we can teach to create many small but appealing toys and mini games. Each program focuses on one key concept or feature, using variables, understanding what makes a program slow, or why and how to name things. Each program feels cool and relevant to game creation. As the teacher, we can hide some code from the student to isolate what we're teaching. And as a result, each program is short and easy to explain. It's not about making programs where you just create a few variables or write useless math functions. I'm talking specifically about making toys and mini games to teach everything in the context of game creation. It's great for students. They get results fast as each project runs in Godot and can be both visual and interactive. The cognitive load is much lower than when creating a complete game because you keep the scope of each project small. You can connect concepts little by little, combine them, and eventually lead the student to create a complete game. Now, you'll probably ask, why don't tutors do this if it's so much better? First, some people do teach with small and fun projects, and people love it. Then it mostly has to do with the fact that making many small and relevant projects is a lot more work than making regular step-by-step -step tutorials. You need a lot more planning to create a good curriculum and you need to code many projects instead of only one. To teach beginners, teaching style also makes a great difference. The academic approach to teaching to code is flawed. It's abstract, theoretical, and often based on ways people coded decades ago. It works for people who enjoy intellectual and abstract complexity, but leaves a majority on the side. My first experience with programming was a C++ textbook a pro recommended me. I hated it and stayed away from code for years after that. It does the same to many people who believe code is all about math and not for them. My biggest gripe with the academic style is teaching theory first. You can hardly understand how programming works with just words. You have to write and test code. 
To teach to a wide audience, it's best to start with a problem and use code to solve it, covering only what's necessary to get results. Then you can dive deeper. When you teach people by example, it keeps them motivated as they instantly see the purpose of what they're learning. It breaks down the learning to not overwhelm them with new concepts and getting results makes people curious to learn more. Lastly, videos and text are not enough. Right now, we don't really have the best tools to practice programming with Godot. At first, the many features in the engine overwhelm beginners. They already struggle with basic syntax and they have to understand virtual callbacks, how their code inherits from the engine and magical things that happen in the background. We are lacking a tool that would allow you to write and test tiny bits of code without having to worry about the ready function, processing, nodes, and so on. We're missing a web app that could cleverly run bits of code inside Godot. And we are making that app, which we already have working right now. It's a prototype, so nothing amazing yet, but I'm going to give you a quick tour of its features and what we're planning. In this prototype, we have the assignment view on the left, the code editor in the center, and the game and output console on the right side. So on the left, you're going to have information about the assignment you're trying to complete with some summary goals, hints, and some checks that are your requirements. In the center, you have a code lens. It might be a complete script. You can have a list of scripts as well. And here we isolate a bunch of code so you can focus on just moving the character and making it jump. Uh, I already have the game working, so I'm going to run it to see on the left the checks turn green because I completed all the goals and that completes the assignment. Now, of course, if I remove some of the jump code and test again, it's not going to work. So uh, we have everything we need really to make these assignments work. We also have the ability to report syntax errors and keep the game running. Even if your code would crash the project, we do that using the GScript syntax server. Now, as you can see, here's the complete enemy script, the base one. We use a code lens to only show some of the code and allow editing some of the code. That way the user can focus on the movement and we can add extra code in the background to make everything work. What's interesting is we could really isolate the creation of variables or basic syntax without the presence of a function to teach basic GDScript. Now there's much more we want to do, but that will take time, testing and a bit of budget. We'll make the lessons to get started with GDScript available for free if we manage to fund it because we're making that complete course to learn to code with Godot. We've been working like crazy for the past month to prepare the beginner programming course the community is missing. It will take months of work to create the many videos, guides, interactive lessons and assignments we have planned, which is why we're taking this project to Kickstarter once more. The community trusted us three times already. With that, we created the largest collection of good tutorials, courses, and free and open source demos. If you are interested, you can uh, check out the link on the screen. And with that, I want to thank you kindly for watching. Be creative, have fun, and I hope to see you again on the GD Quest channel. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, my name is Janus and I will show you my game Blastronaut. After that, I will share some useful tips that I've used to create cool features for this game using the Godot engine. So let's get started. Blastronaut is a 2D mining, exploring and profiting game. You are sent to an alien world with the goal of locating and gathering some valuable resources for a big corporation. And to do the job, you have the access for quite useful tools. For mobility, you have the jetpack that allows you to fly through the world. And to mine the resources, you have the explosive gel, which is extremely dangerous, but also effective. The world is made of biomes, 
that become progressively more difficult as you dig deeper and require better equipment to survive. Eventually, you also have to automate your production to produce the advanced materials and weapons. The game is developed to be extendable and also has an online cooperative multiplayer. For me, the most time-consuming part when making a multiplayer game is testing, because every feature needs to be double-checked. Luckily, Godot allows to run the game directly from the command line without having to package it first. And to make the process even simpler, I've made a small plugin called Multirun, which is now available in the Godot's asset library. This plugin adds a new run button to the Godot's toolbar, and when pressed, it opens multiple game windows simultaneously. It can also be configured to send command line arguments to those games, and in the plaster note, these are used to connect the players together. In the project settings, the multirun tool has its own category, and the number of windows or the command line arguments can be changed in there. Alright, the next thing I want to talk about is the way I am storing the game's data. Plasternaut is a very content heavy game, but having hundreds of resource files might get quite messy. So instead, I've made a system that combines resource objects with JSON data. This is how it works. The data itself is stored in JSON files. And when the game is started, all the JSON files from certain directories are read and parsed. For each data type, there is also the matching resource file, where the names of the exported variables correspond to the names in the JSON dictionaries. And the JSON data is now converted to those resource objects by using a very useful Godot's function called getPropertyList. Once all the objects are populated, there can also be some additional steps. For example, the references between data can now be solved, as in the JSON file they were stored just as names. Finally, all the data is stored in a singleton, so that every script in the game can easily access it. By having such a system, I was also able to create a cool in-game editor where these data files can be changed. Here's an example where the new biome is made by duplicating an existing one and then changing its blocks. Finally, I'm also sure that you want to know how the 2D lighting effects are made. So this is how it's done in principle. The tile maps are divided into two main layers, foreground and background. And the light is drawn as blobs on top of the background layer, where the light sources are additively blended. Both layers are rendered on a separate viewport, which are moved with the camera. And those viewports are inside the viewport containers which have a custom material applied. These materials have custom shaders that basically draws a fancy outline. For example, to make an ambient occlusion effect, a darker outline is drawn outside the foreground layer. The lit up pages are also similarly made. For each light source, the color and the position are sent to the shader, and the light intensity is calculated by taking the dot product between the light direction and surface normal. And combining those effects, the overall lighting looks quite good. So, these were my tips, and I hope you learned something new. If the plaster note seemed interesting for you, then check out my Steam page 
uh, give me a wish list and you can also try the free demo. It's not as fancy as the current version, but the gameplay is still quite fun. So thank you for watching and have a nice Kodokon. Hi everyone, my name is Tim Kriev. I'm an independent developer and I'm working on multiple projects using Godot Engine. Today, I'm going to talk about octahedron sinking dimensions. Godot Engine gives you a lot of freedom in the systems you can implement whether it be traditional ones or unconventional ones. Here, I'll be showing off the most interesting aspects of the game from a Godot Engine user perspective. But first, a little pitch of the game. Octahedron is an upcoming 3D game featuring an innovative and challenging input system and a traditional third-person story mode. Two kids are trying to get their dimension back online by resynchronizing glitchy antennas one by one. To achieve this, they must use the octahedron, an octahedron shaped drone that can be propelled in eight different directions. This drone can't go too far from an already synced antenna or you will lose signal. Not all antennas have to be synced back, but you'll have to find a way to the next dimension. Gameplay-wise, the novel input scheme feels tricky at first, but thanks to the player's slow motion ability, it can be handled and ends up being a fun challenge, offering an interesting way to explore a 3D space. Yes, time is slowed down when selecting a direction to propel the octahedron in. Time manipulation was way easier to implement than expected. I just had to change the engine timescale value. Of course, I also had to change the speed of other mechanics accordingly, like the camera movement, to be sure to counteract the time manipulation. A layer system for the timescale will be a welcome addition for this, but I was able to make it work without one. Next up, the visuals. Shaders have their limits, especially in 3D where you can't really have different layers of shaders applied. For example, a material with a shader will not be shaded behind a transparent material with a shader. In 2D, however, shaders can do this, which is why I decided to put my 3D view in a viewport and apply a 2D shader to it. That way, I was able to overlay multiple screen space shaders. For instance, I have my antenna shader in 3D and my signal loss shader in 2D. And I can even add another 2D blur shader for the pause menu, for instance. The use of viewport can even go further. For example, for my character model, I use the 2D viewport as the model's texture. First, it allows me to control the character's look at will, but on top of that, I can animate the character's eyes in 2D, and then use that animation on the 3D character model.
Lastly, I use the 2D viewport for the character's smartphone screen. I can then display it on the model and use it as my UI by grabbing the focus onto it. Then, Godot's node system allowed me to use a neat trick for the Octahedron's animation. I never had to animate an object that can rotate around three different axes, so I instead created a node tree where each children was centered around one of the axes. That way, I was able to correctly interpolate between the three kinds of rotations. I have many more things to share about Octahedron and how I'm using Godot Engine to make it. If you like this presentation, I talk about these kind of things in my frequent devlogs on my Peertube and YouTube channels. And guess what, <laughs> you can now try the just released Octahedron public demo, if you're interested. Let's continue making great things using and contributing to free, libre and open source tools. It's been Tim Kriyev, thank you for watching. Hello everyone, my name is Pachi Dev if you know me on Twitch and Twitter, or Lily if you know me on Discord. I developed a game called Rhythm MMO, a small online indie game made in Godot, and I'd like to talk about what it is, why it exists, and why I made the decisions I made while developing it in Godot. First off, what is it? Consider sandbox games you've played. Now, consider what they'd be like if they were MMOs. It's not that much of a stretch, since many sandbox games are already multiplayer and sandbox MMOs already exist. Now, consider what it would be like if, instead of holding the mouse down on blocks or using rotations to defeat mobs, you just played a rhythm game. In short, Rhythm MMO is a sandbox MMO with rhythm gameplay where you can create art and upgrade everything modularly. I designed this game because I love the incentive in playing sandbox games and MMOs, but dislike the core gameplay. I do, however, enjoy the core gameplay of rhythm games, but dislike the lack of incentive to progress in them. So it all came together in my mind that a sandbox rhythm MMO would be a great game to play. The way the game works is that you have an open world you can walk around in. Certain areas of the map are open for you to dig in and randomize every so often when the map has emptied. During the game, every zone has its own sort of radio playing. A song is always playing, and you can join in at any time by opening this tab. Depending on what mode you're in, points scored while this window is open can go toward attacking other players and enemies, breaking blocks, and other actions that don't exist in the game yet. By doing this, you can gain resources that will later allow you to upgrade your gear and technology, collect niceties, and build cosmetic gear for customizing your character. This game will allow for custom content based around collecting components, which will be based on clearing content in the game such as raids, PvP, PvE, etc. This game is very early in development, but in present day here's the tech stack. I use Godot for client and server, and Firebase for storage and authentication. My workflow from assets is that I use Clip Studio Paint for 2D, and then Blender and Marvelous Designer for 3D to 2D assets. Right now there are a lot of placeholder assets, but my plan is to create everything in 3D and then render to Ortho 2D utilizing normal emission maps as desired. This will allow for a hand-painted look, but still lend itself to dynamic lighting and effects. Godot is the perfect choice for this project because everything I needed for it works right away out of the box and is easy. My only concerns about the game moving forward relate to the timing regarding audio playback, but to my knowledge it's already being worked on. Regardless, I love Godot Engine and I'll continue to develop the game in it. I believe that this sort of game will lend itself perfectly to cross-platform, so I have tentative plans to develop for mobile as well as the desktop and HTML5 builds I already do. 
This game is very early in development, but it's currently live in alpha on itch.io. If you want to support the project or play the game, alpha keys are available on Patreon, and I myself am active on Twitter, Twitch, and Discord. The project is growing and changing very quickly, so I expect to take over the world very soon. What sort of things would you like to see in a game like this, and what did you think of it? Feedback is really important to me, so feel free to let me know. I'm most active on Discord, but Twitter works too. Thanks for listening, and I hope you all enjoyed my talk. Happy GitOcon 2021. Hey there, and welcome to Our Talk on Out on Chase, an out on themed online multiplayer racing and shooting game inspired by games like Data Wing and Mario Kart. Outrun has two game modes, Death Race and Death Match, which pit players against each other in three high-intensity maps that guarantee to get you and your friends hooked on for hours on end. So without further ado, let's just jump right into gameplay. A little bit about us. We are students from a campus technical group at the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, called STS Labs. Out on Chase started at a one-week game jam which we took part in as members of STS Labs. And the prototype we came up with inspired us to continue its development and make a more polished gameplay experience. The principal thought was a racing mode with a few co-gameplay mechanics. Let's take you through these. Now our mechanics. Drifting is one of our key mechanics. Drifting off walls facing away from them rewards the players with a boost in speed and also fills up their stun gun, which we'll talk about later. This mechanic provides an interesting twist to the racing experience since there's always the risk of colliding with the walls and losing your lead, combined with the benefit of increased thrust, charging your stun gun, and the immense satisfaction that you get when you pull off that perfect drift. Well, the stun gun. All players are equipped with a stun gun, which is charged while drifting along these walls. When a player is shot, the player loses control over his ship for some time, and the ship's orientation is messed up. Now, throughout the map, boost pads are set up at various places that offer significant boosts to the players. Now, speaking of the map, the maps were designed in such a way that it requires skillful execution of these mechanics that we just discussed above. The map design focus was that all of these mechanics are put to use simultaneously, ensuring a proper balance in the game. These maps were designed in such a way that the players are usually captiv are captivated throughout the whole match, and there are no lower intensity points over the course of the match. Well, this was out on chase, and we really look forward to you playing it. With this, we'd like to thank the organizers for giving us a platform to showcase our game, and thanks to all of you for listening. You can drop in on a Discord server if you want to play the game with us. Or maybe even have a little chat. Looking forward to meeting all of you. See you.
Well, hello, Kodokan. Uh, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having us. My name is Andre Stackhouse, and along with my uh, uh, co-founder, Anand Malik, we'll be talking about our first game studio, New Noiseworks. It's brand new, um, and it's a little different. So we think the Godot community is going to be really interested. And let's just go ahead and start by asking everyone, how you doing? How the last couple of years been? Oh, right. So um, I think like a lot of you, Anand and I have had a lot of time at home, just thinking about stuff, maybe working on some stuff. And that got us wondering, what if we made something nice? Um, it's a pretty cool idea, but in order to make something nice, the first thing you have to figure out is what's nice. And this audience might be a little bit biased, but I think these folks know that open source software is nice. Um, and if you look at this set of tech, I, there's, um, so much to like, you know, Linux, itch, Mozilla. Heroic Labs, and of course, Godot. And the reason this particular set of technologies was chosen for this slide is because it sort of implies a, a burgeoning open source stack with which games can be both made and played. And so you're seeing how you, know, you can develop a game on a Linux system and use an open source game engine like Godot, make an open source backend with the products at Heroic Labs, and distribute on open source platforms like itch or even a completely open platform like the web. Um, and so we're seeing the dawning of uh, a more, a more free and open and lower barrier to entry world of game development. And I think that there's a lot of promise for both players and developers down that road. And that's what we want to explore. Um, so, can we take all of these, you know, technologies and pipelines and processes and base a game studio around that? Can we make an open source game studio? And the thing about game studios is it actually turns out, I've done a little research, and they're not actually made out of source code. And so the more appropriate way to think about this question is, can we make a game studio that's based on the concepts and values of free and open source software? And um, there's a lot of questions that come to mind when you think about this, especially in the context of games. Um, you know, can open source games be both free and make money? Can open source products compete with commercial alternatives? Can a game development community make better games than traditional studios? And can a game be both open source and a creative work of art? And, uh, you know, again, this is me and Anon's first game studio. We don't necessarily have answers to all these questions. These are things that we're figuring out and are subject to change. But if you just take a moment to brainstorm some big ideas with us, I think you'll start to get a little bit of an idea of how we see some of this stuff working. And um, so let's just start with actually maybe not so big of an idea, but um, how do we make a game free and also economically viable to support a game studio? Um, and the, you know, the fact is free to play is a tried and true uh, business model in the game industry. And a lot of the most lucrative games are free to play and monetized through the purchase of in-game cosmetics. Um, so in this sense, uh, we can see that it's totally possible to make a game that doesn't price people out, is accessible to everyone, and yet still can be incredibly lucrative. Um, open source games. So open source games have actually been with us from the beginning. Um, you'll see in the lower right corner of this slide, we have NetHack. Um, and I think the open sourceness of NetHack contributed to its uh, popularity, but um, and that it's you know still a very relevant game because of the influence that it had on the roguelike genre. And so the ability to uh, to have its code maintained and be spread and shared, I think, has contributed to its ability to be relevant so many years later. Um, 
And you see similar things with games like 2048. You, you know, it was a game that a lot of people played. It kind of went viral. But part of what made it go viral was that the open source community had a lot of fun with it. And they built a lot of bots and AIs. And, um, you know, so part of what is exciting about this slide is just interesting things happen to your game when you open them up to an entire open source community. And people will do things with these games that the original developers could never necessarily even think about. And yet to the player, they're not even necessarily aware that these games are open source. Um, and so we want to take things just a little bit farther than any of these by saying, what if we made an open source game, but also in an open source engine? And I, you know, we believe that that will really uh, allow us to focus uh, mostly on uh, the game design and making our games fun, um, while also you know, using popular open source technology that makes it easier for the open source community to get involved with our project and and contribute. And, um, you know, that brings us to our third idea, which is the idea of worker ownership. And this is like, if anything, even less trodden territory. And I've only got two examples to share with you right now. Um, but, you know, one of them is a big one. So Motion Twin made the super hit Dead Cells. And a lot of people don't know that that is a worker owned game studio. Uh, down below, we have the Pixel Pushers Union and their game, Tonight We Riot. It's also a great game. Um, so, you know, these are studios that uh, eschew. They don't, they don't have the same traditional uh, structure as a lot of other studios. And to hear it in the words of Motion Twin, if you go to their website, uh, right on their splash screen, they say, no boss. And so that's, um, you know, what a, one of the things we're thinking about in terms of what kind of game studio do we want to have is, uh, can we make a game studio that's better to work at than the AAA game industry, you know, with all of its crunch? Um, and, and so we're trying to think, how do we make games, like, how do we make a game studio that's the best place for creative and talented game developers to work? And we think, how about if they own it? and they make the decisions about it. They know how they want to work. They know how to make good games. And so we think that we don't need a boss to tell us how to do it. Um, so uh, that's the idea of worker ownership. And so all of these are fairly, you know, these are trodden ideas that have been done before. But I think the really big idea is, can we combine all of these ideas into a single product. Um, and so that's why today I'm so excited to pass this off to Anand, who's going to show you the latest footage of our upcoming 2D multiplayer farming sim, The Promised Land. All right, good morning and welcome to The Promised Land. It's about noon here in this little game demo. Uh, you start off with the farm. You have to tend to it and clear it with some uh, expected functionality. You can axe down these trees over here. Expected functionality, excuse me, you know, sit away some uh, weeds, etc. You'll have some uh, crops to manage. You can plant them in tilt soil, water, yada, yada. You know the drill. There's a fishing game, etc. You can go to town. There'll be some characters to talk to. You can talk to them. They'll have clothes eventually. And if you talk to some of them, you might complete missions. There'll be a whole mission structure, experience, yada, yada. Uh, speaking of clothes, you'll be able to change your outfits. We'll have customizable outfits right now. There's only three different looks. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, make a business model around selling these outfits in different kinds. Uh, rerouting 60% to causes that need it. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. We also have the outfits represent those clauses as speak. Um, but this isn't just a single player game, right? It's a multiplayer game. So, hey, look at that. We have uh, four other clients. You can see my first player is represented on the screen. Hey, everyone. You can send a chat message to everybody. Yo, yo. This person. Hey. Let's go to, wow, two's farm. And we could all head over 
uh, to this person's farm over here. Wow, two. Sometimes you have to walk over twice. Uh, let's get everybody over. Uh, and this is all being managed uh, by uh, Godot in the game plan, obviously. Uh, the server technology is uh, Heroic Labs Nakama, as uh, discussed earlier. And uh, a tool called OMGD. So finally, you can see that we can all uh, go on each other's farm and share the experience of farming, whatever that may be, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and tell a different story. Um, we hope to kind of go in the future and uh, show what a more of a utopian society could look like, or just uh, one that's got more things figured out than ours, right? Um, anyway, so all this multiplayer stuff is being developed in Godot and Nakama, and we made a tool called OMGD to kind of uh, to help develop this. So let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, center view. All right. So uh, if Godot makes game development easy, what makes multiplayer game development hard? Uh, it's the internet, right? Godot is a computer program that helps you make other computer programs other games. But once you want to make a multiplayer game, that game has to connect to a server. Uh, and then you have to scale that server. And then if you want to, what if you want to make changes where you just want to demo something on a small team or to a QA team or to your manager or whatever? Uh, how do you do that? Uh, you, well, that, obviously there are ways. Um, I'm a web developer. I've been that way for, <laughs> I've been doing that for about uh, the past decade or so. Uh, and um, uh, one of the biggest things is automation has helped uh, answer those questions as they would pertain to web development. How do you make changes and demo them before pushing them live, as it were? Uh, so what OMGD or Open Multiplayer Game Development opens uh, hopes to do is leverage existing open source technology, much of which comes from the web world. Uh, to automate the development and testing of multiplayer games. So we're using a whole bunch of open source technology on top of open source technology in our stack. Uh, as aforementioned, of course, Godot, uh, Heroic Labs Nakama, which uh, is a distributed server for social and real-time games and apps. Uh, Docker, a uh, very important tool for uh, virtualizing and containerizing uh, an operating system and various things that that could mean. Uh, Docker's amazing, look it up. Uh, itch.io is Butler tool to help us push stuff up to itch. Uh, HashiCorp's Terraform, a very interesting tool which helps us automate the deployment and or the creation uh, and destroying of servers on places like Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services. Essentially, so uh, we can help you create test servers without really you having to know very much, which is uh, neat. Um, and finally, of course, exhibit. You can't stack too many things on top of each other without that. Uh, how do you use OMGD? Uh, it's a command line driven tool for now. Um, it bootstraps the project using Godot and Nakama and it generates code to help enable multiplayer communication, uh, specifically commands like OMGD new your game. Or if you want to call your game, then OMGD code gen. There'll be different code generators, but for now, there's one called channel, which will create a multiplayer channel for you. Uh, it uses Docker to run servers locally for testing and development. And it uses Docker and Terraform to uh, build and deploy your uh, game to the cloud. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, this means setting up and tearing down servers at will, as that were mentioned, uh, such that you can basically test individual changes to dialogue levels, you know, gameplay, whatever, uh, independently and in isolation. So no need for a batch deploy or to uh, coordinate deployments across the whole team or limit on test servers. You can have as many things, uh, services you have to, things to test. Uh, that's up to you as an option. Obviously, you know, there's some pricing limits there. Um, but basically, the big point is that you focus on your game code. OMGD handles the internet stuff. That's that's the goal. Uh, so how all that stuff works uh, for your local development environment, these are some commands that you'll use, most notably uh, OMGD server start tail. It's to tell the server. And you'll be using a combination of Heroic Labs, Godot, and Docker to tie this all together. Uh, the client build, you'll need to basically build things. You can do this in Godot, but we uh, use Docker uh, to help build for other environments like staging and production. Um, and we use uh, Godot and Docker for that. And uh, using those commands, you'll uh, get uh, the outputs of the Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux builds, as well as, web, as, well as the web build. Uh, server deploy is going to be wrapped up in one deploy command linked to a profile that you'll create, profile-name is the linkage. It'll use Terraform to deploy to Google Cloud Platform for now uh, and to be uh, written in as support for Amazon Web Services, Azure, uh, uh, DO, hopefully your own on-prem setup as well. All of that can be supported by Terraform, so it should not be too difficult uh, to also support on-prem. 
um, and then uh, we want to deploy clients uh, wherever, which is what we're going to now. We want to get to Steam, GOG, and other providers as well uh, to, to figure out where things go and what your account information is on things like Itch and Google Cloud. Uh, we use a YAML configuration. Uh, it's a very simple file. You're looking at it. Um, you can use the game block for your own custom variables if you wish to have uh, different profiles of different variables. For instance, the promised land locally, we run the time scale of one shortened time sometimes just to test things. Uh, but on the servers, we'll run it at a different scale. And this is how we use that, uh, how we control that. Uh, for data that's um, consistent across profiles, but used in your game and server, uh, things like prices, things you'd want synced for a matter of hacking authority, et cetera. Uh, you can use the resources folder uh, and a template system to uh, build templates such that data can uh, be shared by both your server and client builds. All right. Gross. All right, so let's go over some uh, limitations, uh, which will recast the strengths of the tool and where it's currently at right now. Uh, so. One big limitation is that real time uh, is written in a separate programming uh, and language, Lua or Golang, as opposed to GDScript. It basically needs no headless uh, Godot server um, is actually running on the servers, and it makes authoritative collision detection hard, which makes shooters hard. And um, that's a little bit tough, but we might be able to support that. No MGDV2, so limitation currently. Another limitation is that. Uh, this does require a good amount of comfort with the command line and Git, which not all game developers are great with. Um, managing a Google Cloud or an Amazon Web Services, Azure, et cetera, account, still a technical challenge, more or less. It's a light one, even with OMGD, uh, and, and that's a bit tough. Um, and it's, OMGD itself isn't necessarily ready for production use cases. So let's, uh, let's see if we can flip these as screens, which is true. So with regards to real time, uh, this is still great for turn-based games, card games, single-player games with limited online features, um, like high scores or just checking the back end to see what other players did at that point in the game, etc. Uh, that's very achievable right now with um, Godot and Nakama. Um, and collision detection is like, who cares? Also, we'll probably have to wait for Godot 4 to support everything, and that's good. It's a motif. Um, the command line's a wild animal. If you're uncomfortable with it, you should just, uh, just try to treat it like something that you're understanding. Uh, in all seriousness, though, if we can keep this project up, we'll make uh, GUI tools. We won't make people run command lines, fine, um, and installers, etc. Uh, in regards to having uh, difficulty setting up a cloud-based accounts uh, with billing, etc., we could potentially make a cloud-based build tool um, to aid development and act as a middleman for you and manage those things, um, and, and figure out what that means as an open-source company, especially. Uh, and as far as production use case of OMGD, uh, Godot and Nakama are production ready. So I think it's important to know. All right, so let's look at a potential roadmap for OMGD. Uh, right now we're on version zero, that's our release currently. Uh, for version one, uh, we'd like to have a well-defined release strategy, Windows support, uh, an idea of how to expand the code both internally and externally, um, and a really solid versioning strategy, not just for the CLI and release tool, but also for the sub packages and code generators. Uh, we'll be making. So just figure out how to uh, define this as a code package um, such that it can be expandable without having to make a major rewrite uh, to support those things down the road. Um, and, and let's see if we can do a limited set of features. Version 2, and, and this could happen earlier if someone really wants to support it, I think it would be great. It would be to support something called the GONES, uh, which is going to allow scalable headless Godot builds as servers via Kubernetes. Um, which, you know, we'd still obviously keep not going for all the other uh, services that supports authentication, storage, etc. Uh, but um, this would unlock collision section for us um, in an authoritative way. Uh, ideally, this would release around the same time or after, you know, 4.0 stabilizes. It, it would probably take a bit to figure out. Um, it, 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 it could work with three, though. Anyway, eventually what we'd like to do is support all actors in a typical game studio, artists, writers, PMs, QAs. Uh, investors and stakeholders, et cetera. Everybody should be able to make little changes and show them to each other, uh, regardless of uh, location, especially since so many of us are working remotely. All right. Um, that's, uh, that's it. We're really excited to uh, to take a step forward, obviously doing anything open source is a little bit new, especially on the company level, but I think it does start with uh, 
tools, and uh, that starts with um, getting con contributors if we can. Uh, please head over to github.com new noise works. You can check out this project. We'll have a promise and open source as well. Um, and, and check out the game at the website here if you want a little more information, um, or as well as our Twitter account. All right, take care.
Hello and welcome to my presentation about Godot Force Decoil Node. Since there is a lot of information to cover about the new decoil implementation, I thought it would be a good idea to make a presentation about decoils in Godot 4. Let's start with a quick introduction. My name is Hugo Lockershaw. I am a Godot engine contributor currently working full time on Godot. And uh, my areas of interest are quite diverse, since uh, on top of being a web developer, I also contribute to editor usability, visual design and documentation. I even work on rendering tasks on the side. So here is the outline of this talk. First, we will start by looking at common use cases for decals in video games. Then we will take a brief look at how the new decal node is implemented in Godot 4 and the trade-offs implied by these technical choices. Then I will go over the decal node various properties and explain what each property does. Then I will mention some performance key -lats. And finally, the end of this talk is dedicated to using decal nodes in real-world scenarios. It will not only demonstrate how to use decal nodes, but it will also showcase some fancy effects you can use and create by thinking outside the box. So, if you are new to fluidity game development, you may be wondering what decals are useful for in video games. Decals are useful for aesthetic purposes, but also for gameplay purposes. One of the most common use cases you may be thinking of when hearing the word decal may be uh, bullet holes, blood splatter, explosion marks, and so on. But uh, decals can also be used to project what we call blob shadows, which are commonly found in mobile games for performance reasons but can be also useful for gameplay reasons, as we will see later in this talk. This is because blob shadows are much cheaper to render compared to real-time shadow maps. And uh, in the last uh, 10 years, we've seen an uh, increasing use of uh, decals in modern uh, game engines uh, to add extra details on surfaces and break up uh, texture repetition. In a modern AAA game, it's common to use hundreds of decals in a single level, if not thousands. Finally, with the advent of physically based rendering, it is possible to have decals that interact with this uh, PBR material system. For instance, you can have decals that reduce a material's roughness in a specific area, which effect effectively creates a wet puddle effect of sorts. Godot 4 makes use of a new clustered forward renderer on desktop platforms. This renderer makes it possible to display more lights, more reflection props, and more decals on the screen with a lower performance cost compared to a traditional approach. The downside is that a cluster renderer has a higher base cost. This means that your frame rate will be lower in very simple scenes, but in any complex scene, your frame rate will be much higher. So this approach is often used in AAA games nowadays. On mobile platform, the base cost of a clustered renderer is too high. Instead, a traditional forward rendering approach is used, like in Godot 3. This means the number of decals per mesh is limited, in a way similar to lights. This limit is currently hardcoded to 8 decals per mesh, but it may be possible to increase it in the future. To optimize rendering, the decal textures in use will be put into an atlas generated at runtime. It's still possible to load any texture you want into a decal at runtime, so you can do things like user-provided spray if you want. Decals are rendered directly into the material using a shader. The engine will not generate meshes to draw decals using transparent materials. This makes it possible to place decals on complex meshes with thousands of polygons or more without a performance penalty. You can even move these decals every frame on those complex meshes since the decal itself will not need to update its own mesh. Thanks to this modern rendering approach, Godot also avoids issues related to Z-fighting that could be visible on daystone decals. For reference, Z-fighting is what uh, causes surface to pop in and out in the distance due to the depth buffer lacking precision. Now, let's go through the properties offered by this new decal node. Godot Force Decal Node offers a dozen of properties which allows you to control its behavior. In this section, I will go through each of those properties and explain them briefly. The first property is Extents, which affects the size of the projected decal. 
the x and z axes of the vector tree will affect the size, whereas the y coordinates will affect the projection height. Increasing the projection height makes it possible for the decal to have a smoother phase transition. However, if you increase the height too much, you will make rendering less efficient. On top of that, the decal will risk painting multiple surfaces in a way that you don't expect. For instance, it could paint several floors at once in a building. Due to this, I recommend being conservative with the decal's height, unless you have a good reason to make it extend taller. Now, on to the upper fade and lower fade properties. These properties control how fast the decal will fade on surfaces that are placed above the decal and below the decal, respectively. For decals that fade smoothly, such as blob shadows, I recommend setting both to linear falloff. You can do this by right-clicking the curve properties and clicking on the linear preset. For hard surface decals such as nuts and bolts, pick the zero preset since it ensures the decal is always displaced with its full opacity. The normal fade property is another property that controls how the decal will fade. However, instead of being based on distance from the decal's origin, this property will make the decal fade depending on the surface angle. For performance reasons, decals use standard projection instead of something like a tree planar projection. This means that the decals that are, that are projected onto steep surfaces will be distorted unless the decal is rotated appropriately. However, it is not always possible to rotate the decal to match a curved surface well. This is where the normal fade property comes in. Since normal fade requires doing some relatively expensive per pixel calculation, it has a performance cost. If you don't need its effect, leave it as its default value, which is zero. This second slide of the decal node properties is dedicated to textures. Without an albedo or emission texture defined, the decal will simply not show up in the scene, so you absolutely need a texture. The albedo texture will paint onto the surface albedo map. It can be opaque or translucent to leave the underlying surface partially visible. The emission texture works like the albedo textures, but it glows in the dark. Whiter parts of the texture will glow even more, and black areas will not glow at all. It works in an additive manner. The alpha channel of the emission texture is ignored. Now on to the ORM texture, which stands for Occlusion Roughness Metallic. These three texture maps are used to influence the underlying surface PBR maps. An ORM map is created by putting the ambient occlusion map into the red channel, the roughness map into the green channel, and the metallic map into the blue channel. You can perform this operation using an image editor such as GIMP. When converting many PBR maps in a row, a command line tool like ImageMagic will be more convenient. Note that the alpha shadow of the ORM textures is ignored like the emission. Instead, the albedo textures alpha channel will control how much the ORM textures should blend onto the underlying surface. Finally, the normal texture can be used to add a bumpiness onto a surface. Like with tender materials, this bumpiness will interact with light splice in a scene. This can be used to give more depth to your decals. Like the ORM texture I described just above, the normal map's texture alpha channel is ignored. Instead, the albedo texture's alpha channel will control how much the normal map should blend onto the underlying surface. So let's continue with decal node properties. The albedo mix property controls how much influence the albedo texture has on the underlying material's albedo map. You may be wondering why we have these properties when we can just adduce the modulate properties opacity. Unlike the modulate properties, albedo mix will not affect how much the ORM and normal maps are painted onto the underlying surface. Therefore, you need to decrease albedo mix to create effects such as white puddles, which generally only influence the underlying surface roughness map. The last properties I'll present today is the cool mask. These properties define which visual layers the decal should affect. You can configure any 2D object visual layers in the inspector. For example, if you have an object on visual layers 1 and 2, 
but the decal has a decal mask with only the layer 3, the decal will not be drawn on this object. The decal map properties is useful to prevent static decals from being drawn onto dynamic objects. For example, you wouldn't want a graffiti decal to be painted on top of players as they move on top of this decal. An easy way to avoid this is to put all your dynamic objects on a separate visual layer and remove them from the first layer, which is the default. Then configure your decal skull mask to only affect the first layer by unchecking all other layers. Now, let's talk about performance consideration when using decals. As I said before, CodoForce decal node uses a clustered approach to rendering on desktop platforms. This makes individual decals fast to render, but this does not mean you can use an infinite amount of decals in your scene. The performance cost taken by individual decals is mostly determined by the percentage of the screen covered by the decal. That said, small decals in the distance will still take time to render, so I recommend configuring the distance fade properties to benefit from level of detail optimizations. You will have to configure the fading distances manually for each decal. I recommend using larger fade distances for larger decals and larger fade transition periods if your camera moves fast, for example in a racing game. This helps make the transition feel less sudden, which avoids distracting popping effects. Also, when not using any decal node in a scene, the engine will be able to turn off the related buffer allocations. This further improves rendering performance. When targeting low-end platforms such as integrated graphics or mobile, consider disabling the use of decals entirely by providing a setting. If you cannot disable all decals, then use Godot's group functionality to disable non-essential decals that do not serve gameplay purposes. You can disable a decal simply by hiding the nogin question. Now that we've learned about the theory, let's look into some practical uses for this new decal node. For dynamic objects, you will generally have to add decal nodes at runtime, you can do this by instancing a scene. Make sure to use a, a recast node to determine where the collision happens and use the collision normal to rotate the decal accordingly. Remember to call the Q3 method on the decal once it is no longer visible. This way, it doesn't clutter the scene tree anymore, which avoids performance issues. Also remember that you can use animation players to add various effects to your decal which helps make your decal feel less static. Make use of the extend properties to adjust the scale at runtime and use the modulate properties to adjust the opacity in real time as well. One common use case for decals is blob shadows. This kind of shadows is generally used for dynamic objects and has a much lower cost than real time shadow maps. Thanks to their low rendering cost, blob shadows can be used on mobile and web platforms. But blob shadows can also be used as a complement to real-time shadows. Let's take the example of a hybrid light mapping setup where the sun is a real-time light, but all points lights such as lamps are baked. This kind of setup is a good compromise to offer good performance without giving up on real-time sun shadows. However, when using this hybrid light mapping setup, dynamic objects will no longer cast shadows while indoors. So my recommendation is to use blob shadows for dynamic objects that are located indoors. This way, a dynamic object will still feel grounded while indoors. Nonetheless, blob shadows can also serve gameplay purposes in certain genres. For instance, in a 3D platformer game, the player needs to be able to see where their character will land at any time while they are airborne. A blob shadows pointing straight down perfectly answer these questions. Another up-and-coming use case for decals is to use them for permanent de decorative purposes. There are several ways you can use static decals to enhance your scene's visuals. One way would be to use decals to represent small, hard surface details on top of existing materials. This also helps keep your material calm down, which reduces memory usage and file size on disk. This is especially true as your textures get larger. For instance, if you use 4K texture, like many modern games do nowadays. For instance, thanks to this decal node, you can add rust on top of an existing metallic grey surface or add a dirt on top of grass. The added variety in the final result helps break up repetition when a texture is used over a large surface. 
code of force decode node can also interact with physically based rendering, which means you can use it to create effects like wet puddles. You could also improve existing decals, such as the rust effect I mentioned, by playing with the roughness and metallic maps in the decals ORM textures. Finally, the ambient occlusion map of a decal can be used to provide more depth to the decal. It works especially well when you use it in tandem with a normal map for the decal. Now, let's see what we can do with the decal node outside of the common use cases. A nice use case I found for the decal node is to use simulate volumetric fog in specific areas. On top of working with dynamic objects, this effect looks quite good as long as the camera doesn't enter the fog volume. If the camera enters the fog volume, then the effect will start breaking down. As a workaround, you could twin the global fog intensity while the camera is inside the volume. You could do this with an area 3D node that checks whether the camera is inside the fog volume and adjusts the fog intensity and color to match the fog from the volume. You could also use a noise texture to introduce subtle variations to the fog, which can create an even more convincing fog effect. This is another special use case for decals. In Godot 4, you could use a decal node that spans a large area to simulate cloud shadows. During the day, if you look at some planes outside when there is significant cloud coverage, you will see that clouds will cast shadows on planes. These decals aim to simulate that effect and makes outdoor scenes look more alive. Since the decal will cover a large area of the screen when the player is outdoor, it will have a significant performance cost. I recommend you add a setting to turn off cloud shadows for people playing on low-end GPUs. One last fancy use case for decals might be to use them to simulate water caustics. Caustics are the reflection of light on the water's waves visible both above and below the surface. You can see caustics in and around a pool that is outside, for instance, when there is a sunny weather. To give the illusion of animated caustics, you can swap in the texture every so often. In my experience, it doesn't really cause slowdowns in terms of performance. You could maybe use an animated texture resource, but uh, I'm not sure whether it works with decals. It might work, so please test if you can. It may also be possible to use a viewport texture that updates in real time, but I couldn't get that to work at the time of recording this video. So to sum up, decals are yet another tool available in the game developer's toolbox to further improve their game's visuals. In Godot 4, you can now use large amounts of decals to add variety to your scene and give more impact to events occurring in the game. Also, I want to emphasize the importance of blob shadows in modern games. Their use is not just constrained to mobile games or games that target low-end systems. When used correctly, blob shadows can add a lot of realism to a scene in a way that effects like SSAO cannot provide due to their limitation of a screen space algorithm. So I encourage you to check the demo project I made for these presentations. It contains all the scenes I've used to record the video I showcase here, plus some bonus scenes with more experimental stuff that I've tried with decals. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, see you next time!
Hello, my name is Ilya Kuznetsov and I am a programmer in a small team called Excellent. We are currently developing our card game called Stuff Only. It's a card game uh, where you play card space solving puzzle instead of paying some sort of mana. And it's kind of similar to Slice of Spire. Uh, so, uh, I want to tell you about designing uh, complex effects with the help of Godot. Uh, and in my example, it will be a card game, a card game but uh, these approaches can be used in any sort of games where you have some complex effects and abilities, like RPGs or similar. Uh, when you start designing your card game, you usually start with a small number of cards and small number of effects. Uh, and at this point, it might seem like a good idea to have a big JSON file holding all your card information and effects references. This approach, sadly, becomes too complex too quickly when you use it. And uh, when you have something like 50 or 100 cards, uh, it will be a nightmare to find them in this JSON file and edit it. Uh, you can write some external tools to help you with it, but instead we can just use uh, built-in Godot instruments to help us. Like for us, Godot has systems that can be used uh, to lighten these approaches. Uh, and uh, the most approaches I will be showing you to design complex game effects uh, won't require any specific knowledge once they are already in place. And if you're uh, an only programmer in your team and you have a game designer who can't really program but designs well, uh, they will be able to use any of these approaches without any programming. So about this tutorial, I will be using c -sharp language uh, not because I don't like GDScript, but because I am mostly familiar with c -sharp. I very much enjoy its type safety uh, in compile time and in runtime. And I also very much enjoy Link, which is a C-sharp feature that allows us to uh, filter or change collections quickly and effortlessly. Uh, this is not a UI tutorial. I have a prototype with a card game, but if you want to use it as a foundation for your card game, you still have a lot of work to do. But uh, the card info and card effects stuff uh, you will be able to use uh, um, more easily, in, e even in an already existing project. Uh, all the code I will be showing you is available in a GitHub repo. Uh, and uh, mostly I will be concentrating on showing you different approaches of creating, changing and loading card info and card effects. So, the first approach I want to show you is a node-based approach. Each card info will be a node with different exported properties and all effects will be subnodes. This approach is very native to Godot. Uh, it's Similar to uh, how physics body and collision shape work, when where you have a, a node with some basic behavior like, like physics body, and you change, uh, modify its behavior by adding child nodes. Let me show you. In this approach, each card will be a separate scene, and uh, I still have to clear, clear a little bit here, but it's pretty quick. Uh, each card will be a separate scene, and what is a card info? In this approach, card info is a node, as I already told you. Told you, it has a bunch of exported properties. Uh, it's description description marked as multi-line text, so it is easy to edit card text. And uh, uh, its effects are just uh, 
uh, its children of type card defect. And what about some card effects? We have an attack. We have what about a card effect? Card effect is a node with a single method called execute. And uh, we have different uh, uh, concrete card effects like attack, which when executed lowers enemy health by attack value, like defense, which increases player defense value. And we have this complex effect called if full health. Uh, it changes if player has 20 health or not. And when a player has 20 health, it loads uh, its first child uh, on index 0. And if player doesn't have 20 health, it loads a child card effect on index 1. So a second card effect. Uh, how does it work? So... Uh, When in, in this approach, uh, when we are creating a new card, we have to create a new scene. Uh, with root node being a card info. Uh, its name will be link. And what it effect will be? Uh, if health is at 20, attack 20, on else, attack 3. So, how do we do it? Are we creating a node. Let's name it health checker. We are creating another node called attack 20 and another node called attack 3. There should be in this sort. So, uh, health shaker should have an effect if full health. And attack, attack 20 should have an effect attack with value 20. And attack 3 should have, should be an attack with value 3. Uh, okay, so uh, this card won't be in a game just yet, because in this approach we still have a database uh, which holds all our card in this sort of array. So we still have to create a new item in this array, drag and drop this our new card big attack, and when we try to run a game, We'll have this new card in our hand, and if we play it, we will deal 20 damage to an enemy. Uh, okay, so what's the different uh, advantages and disadvantages of this approach? This approach is very easy to understand. Uh, uh, you just create a new scene when you want to create a new card. Everything in this approach is a node, so it... Uh, should be pretty familiar to someone who has already some familiarity with Godot. But what are disadvantages? Well, sub effects are not really obvious in this approach because, uh, as you could see, uh, we always have this uh, in a health checker, we always have an uh, uh, effect that will be executed first as its first child and effect that should be executed uh, not on full health as its second child. But uh, also when you are loading uh, cards in this approach, you're not loading card info directly. You're loading packed scenes and you still have to instance them and add somewhere to, to your tree. Uh, also, it's not really obvious what to use in an ID. Uh, you could use a packed scene path, or you could use an index in a database array, but uh, uh, you don't have something direct uh, 
to have as an ID. Uh, you probably would like to have an ID since uh, you still have to save and load what cards your player has somewhere. Uh, also, you uh, must always free unused card infos in this approach. Since each card info is a node, uh, you will be managing its lifetime by yourself. So what's another approach? Uh, another approach is an autoloaded database. Uh, each card info is still a node, so this code didn't change, but uh, uh, all your card info nodes will be inside a, data a global database scene, which will be autoloaded, it will be singleton. Uh, all effects are still subnodes, and let me show you how it works. We still have our basic game. Uh, all, uh, all cards are gone from this directory because all cards are now in this database scene. This database scene is autoloaded. We are using in the project settings. Uh, and how do you create a new card in this approach? So you are just creating a child node uh, with the same parameters, the same uh, subnodes. And we are signing scripts here. This card will be called the same. I won't be uh, writing any description on it right now. Uh, so we still will have our health checker. If full health, attack 20 will still be attack with attack value 20. And attack 3 will still be an attack with attack value 3. So, uh, it's almost the same, probably a little bit easier. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this approach? Everything is still a note. Uh, we have a ready-to-use card database uh, because we are adding cards directly to this database scene. Uh, each node path of card info node is a unique card ID, so you can save and load it directly. Uh, and there's no need to free uh, card infos uh, because they are part of this database, global database, uh, and uh, uh, each card is always in memory. Uh, you probably even won't, uh, uh, wouldn't like to free it since there is possibility that this card info will be deleted from the database. You probably won't want that. Uh, the disadvantage is that this database is, while still easier to maintain than the big JSON file, it's still uh, hard to maintain when you have lots and lots of different cards and different effects uh, on cards. Uh, you will have to use something some like search this big tree uh, to change uh, a card when you will have to do it. Uh, but this approach is still very much usable when you don't have too many cards. Maybe like something around 30 or 50. And this approach is very much usable in an, something like RPG game uh, where you will have not too many NPCs and not too many abilities. And the final approach I want to show you is a resource-based approach. Uh, each card info will be a resource file and effects will be exported properties and also a resource. Uh, what is a resource in Godot? Well, a uh, resource is uh, 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 different from the node. Uh, they are, can be saved uh, as a file in your project and they can be loaded uh, when your project is running and uh, they are reference counted, which means you won't have to worry about freeing them or managing their lifecycle. Godot will do it for you automatically. Uh, uh, 
uh, different examples of native resources that you probably have in your Godot game uh, include texture files, uh, audio files, etc. Uh, let me show you how this resource-based approach is working. So, uh, each card in this approach will be a resource. Other than that, almost nothing has changed. We still have our exported properties and the card effects are now exported as a card effect array. So what is a card effect now? Card effects is also a resource, but other than that, nothing has changed. It still has this method called execute. The only card effect that changed a lot is the if pull health effect because it no longer uses nodes, because card effect is no longer a node. Uh, instead, it has two exported card effects properties uh, that uh, execute uh, uh, if player on 20 health or not. Uh, how would we create a new card in this approach? Uh, as you can see, each card is a separate file. And if you want to create a new card, you create a new resource. Uh, you still set its script to card info. You still have to write everything you've written before. But when you create a new effect, uh, things began to be not so easy and beautiful because to create a new effect you will have to create it in the memory by using this button create a new resource in memory uh, when creating a new resource in memory you will have to assign script as usual but uh, with this health checker you still have two effects uh, to assign and you will have to create a new, yet another resource in memory and assign a new script. And it's easy to lose track in all of that. Instead of doing that, uh, we can write a plugin. Uh, I will show you how it is written uh, soon, but let me show you what this plugin will allow you to do. We just left click on this effect, click if full health, if full health, then attack 20, and not, if not at full health, attack 3. That's all. Uh, and all our resources are created as a sub resource to this file uh, and will be inside this. Uh, how would we uh, hold all of these cards in some sort of database? Well, actually, we don't have to, because since all our uh, cards are resources, we can load them directly via file path. So we will have to enumerate through this directory and load them. And that means that our directory is the database. Uh, so, how would you write this plugin? Uh, well, turns out it's turns out it's not hard. You just have to create a plugin CFG file and create a small class uh, that will uh, implement the plugin. And what will be the logic? We will have to add a new type called card info to our game and uh, we will have to add all our effects by enumerating in directory with uh, effect. So what is a plugin CFG file? It's a, just an ini file that started with this plugin header. Uh, it has a name, a version, and a script reference. And the script it will be a class that's accessing an editor plugin class. It's marked as a tool, so we can use it inside the engine itself. Uh, 
and on loading it's uh, adding custom type card info from C sharp file and uh, also it's it enumerates through this directory adding all the types it can uh, with the prefix zero dot effect slash uh, and when this plugin is unloaded it removes all the types we are adding when entering uh, why do we need a prefix well uh, because when you are adding a new resource godot will show you all the resources available in the engine and it's not really easy to find the resource you need if it's not alphabetically sorted to be on top so we are adding a leading zero so all our effects will be on top this plugin is pretty short it's only 77 lines uh, and you can use it in your project uh, from the start to finish almost never changing it so what's the different pros and cons of this approach well, database is a directory. So, uh, since you're enumerating the directory to load all your cards, uh, you can have an, any directory structure you want. Uh, and uh, if you want to delete a card from a game, you are just deleting a file. If you want uh, to move it to some other part of your, of your database, you're just moving it to another directory. It can be really easier than that. Uh, each card has a unique ID and it's its file path. Uh, you can save this file path as strings and when you're loading the strings, you can load the cards from this file path. Uh, resources are never in Sentry, so it's it, very much easier to maintain it, uh, their life cycle. Uh, you won't uh, have to free them. You're just loading them and Godot unloads them when not needed. They're type safe, type safe unload. You, uh, in C Sharp, that means that you're loading a card info directly, not a packed scene that you have to then instance. And this approach is extremely easy to maintain. If you want to add something new, you're adding a file. If you want to delete something, you're deleting a file. You have your... Uh, a git repository where you can see all the differences all the files that were added changed it's extremely easy to maintain the only disadvantage is that you will have to write a godot plugin uh, to make this approach usable but as you already saw uh, this god plugin is pretty simple and it's uh, pretty easy to write Well, that's all that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this tutorial. And I hope you learned something new. And I hope, hope that uh, when you will be creating a game with some complex game effects, like a card game or an RPG or something that you come up yourself, uh, these different approaches will be of help to you. Thank you very much.
Hi, um, I'm Michael from Rot X Blau, from a German indie game studio. Um, it's the first time for us at GodotCon. We're really happy to be here. Um, we've been using Godot for maybe two years, I think, and now we're using it ex exclusively. And uh, we are we are a, a very young um, indie game studio, so this is actually the first year that we are probably in incorporated properly. And um, so this is really new for us, and Godot has been a great help. And uh, we've been working on some projects, some game projects, um, some other things, uh, but our main uh, software that we are doing right now is a middleware. It's called Trophix. So I want to talk to you about Trophix and how we how we want to use it for our own games. But it might also be something that's of interest to you. So we'll see how it all works out. We haven't really made up our minds if we are going to sell it or open source it or if it's e even um, when it's going to be in that state. But uh, it's all up to you also. Um, just talk to us if, if you're interested in it. So, um, yeah, it all started with, a, I think, a, a technology grant from the university, which helps small startups to, to actually um, make that move into the world and start their own company. Um, for this particular uh, grant, we needed some technical, technical innovation. So we asked ourselves, um, we want to make games. Um, what's, what's our technical innovation? And uh, luckily, in our team, I'll just show you a mock-up of our team. One of us is a biologist, that's Florian, um, the, the guy in the yellow shirt. Um, so he studied biology and, um, and uh, he gave us an idea. So um, why not use the ideas of ecosystem modeling that he knows from, from biology at the university? Why not use it for computer games? Um, which is a very different way of doing it. You see, um, in, in biology, you, usually it's, it's more like statistically based. So if you want to find out how a certain population or a certain system would develop, you would not look at the individual agents, but rather you would look at, at the entire ecosystem and then use statistics to evaluate it. So I'm not a biologist, I can't go into too much of the details, but um, our idea was, why not take the, the general principles of modeling and take them over, bring them over to computer games. So in computer games, it's individual agents that we need to simulate. Um, so it's not so much statistics for the simulation, but uh, so, so the big question was, could we, will we manage to simulate thousands of agents in an, in an ecosystem in real time? And we did that in Godot, and now, like a year later, we can say it is possible. There, there were a lot of um, problems, but I think we solved the main issues, and that's what I want to show to you. So, um, just to give you an idea, we've got this animation here on our homepage. Um, there are different species in an ecosystem, and they have different areas where they exist. So maybe they need more light or less light, maybe they need more water or less water, maybe they do need different ground. And so they are populating like a space, like an area in the system, and, um, and then they are fighting for that area in that system. So um, we want to simulate all that. So, so in an ecosystem there are like producers, like um, plants that are creating energy and then there are consumers like um, animals walking around eating those plants and and then there might be consumers of a, of a second level which are eating other consumers so it's all interrelated and, and the, the really interesting thing about it if, if, if one part of an ecosystem breaks away it means it has repercussions on any other species, any other agent, any other individual in that ecosystem. So we started to think about it more and more and more and then we realized, hey, that, that might actually be an, a really interesting way of structuring a computer game. Because if you think about it, we are always thinking about how can we, how can we structure the progression of the game. So let's say like in a in, in Doom, yeah, the original Doom game, you're looking for key cards and then there are 
There are doors that, that you can't open if you don't have a specific key card. So you construct your level in a way that says only if you find the right key card you are able to progress into this other area of the map. And, and if you take this idea and, and apply it to an ecosystem model, you could say, well, in the beginning, there might only be one or two species in the world. And as the population grows, and it only grows if those species are in a healthy relationship, like if, if a mouse eats away all the plants, then the mouse will starve as well because there won't be any other plants arriving in that ecosystem. But if it's, it's, if it's balanced... It would mean that um, there's enough food for all the mice and both of the species that can, they can grow and, and there'll be more and more of them. So we could say, let's say there are more than 200 mice. At this point, another species might enter that ecosystem, could be a fox or something. So now we have three species and, and this would, would be the progression. We, we would say the ecosystem has to be in a certain state in a certain state of healthiness or of progression for our game to advance. So that's the idea. In the, in the image this you see here um, that I've opened up on my screen, um, there are different entities that are in relationship to each other. There's the, the, the ground, there's the light, um, and then there are certain consumers and producers, and they're all interrelated. And they can only exist if certain parameters are, are fulfilled. Okay, so that's the general idea. We will build an ecosystem that simulates thousands of agents and their relationships, and we hope to have that running on smartphones. So that's an interesting way to do it. And another thing immediately occurred to us when we designed this, um, we realized that it would be very difficult to actually find the parameters that make our system stable. So what is a stable ecosystem? Um, if each species has certain needs, certain parameters like how fast can it walk, how many offsprings will it produce um, if it um, um, reproduces, um, and thousands of other parameters, then it will be, for us, it, it, it might be overwhelming to actually find a, a structure, a, a set of parameters that result in a in a stable ecosystem. So we realized we need to do tools that support us in finding those stable parameters. Okay, um, first we did a real basic game, um, like where we simulate a demonstration and there's different agents, they have different, um, different uh, goals. For example, one person at, the, uh, at this demonstration might be pro something, the other person might be against something. And this was our first test on how to do little state machines, on how to find parameters, on how to balance a game. Um, so one way would be like the demonstration gets stopped and there's lots of police, and the other way it turns out there's lots of happy people and this, uh, the uh, ecosystem, in, in, in this case, the demonstration is healthy. Um, that worked out pretty well, and from there we went to a different game, which I will show you about later on. Um, okay, so what did we do? Um, let me show you an overview graph, if I can find it. Here it is. Let me show you what we have designed for now. This is not inside of Godot, but rather it is... Um, it is the structure behind it that enables us to run a lot of simulations. Um, so we are we've been using web technology for a while, and so we know about Docker, about containerization of applications, and we know about databases, and we know about um, web frameworks. And the idea was. Let's throw all that together and, and let's build something that enables us to say, okay, we've got this ecosystem here, um, but we're not sure how many offspring should be created. Okay, let me show you what we've built in Godot so far and how it all relates to the entire middleware. So um, this is a test scene that we are building. We have some placeholder graphics that we built for our, for our game Coyote that we're working on where we are using Trophics in. Um, 
if I start this game, you can see there are different agents roaming the world and, and um, they have different states. So if I turn on the debug tools, you can see this fox here, he's idle. But now um, she turned into roaming state because she's thirsty. And, well, she found something to drink and now um, she's idle again. Okay, she needs to defecate, so, so she's pooping. And, uh, and now she's roaming again, walking around. I think trying to find something to eat. Now she found a mouse and, uh, and is eating it. Um, as you can see, we've got a quad tree um, because since all the agents need to know about each other, like fleeing or, or attacking, uh, we needed to do a lot of distance lookups and we did that entirely in our middleware and not through the physics engine. Um, so we need a quad tree to speed this up. These are the red and blue markers on the ground. Um, so, as you can see, um, foxes are eating the mice. Mice are looking for food. There's some grass that we're simulating through a shader. And, um, and you can see there are about 70 mice in this ecosystem at the moment. Uh, about 10,000 grass agents, some droppings from the pooping agents and, um, and there's two nesting sites. Some of the agents, they, um, when they get pregnant, they search or build a nesting site and this is where they um, get their offspring. So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. We have different ground um, that also influences simulation. But it's, uh, I mean, at this state, we're happy that it's all stable and running, and running also with, with 1,000 agents. It's multi-threaded and everything. But, um, but this is not really the, the main thing about our system. So uh, what is actually happening in the background is, um, while this simulation is running, we are logging a lot of data about each agent, about the state they're in, about... Um, about certain parameters that define them. We are logging them into a database and then we are evaluating it, like plotting graphs from it. How is the population changing over time? Which of the parameters influence the simulation most? Stuff like that. And this is, this is the, the second part of our system. So if you want to know more about how we build this in, in Godot, just get in contact. But, uh, but really, it's, um, the most difficult part was to make it um, performance make the performance good enough for thousands of agents but the main key to that was multi-threading and we are updating the state machines once in a second and then we are just using detour that's a navigation library where, where there's a really nice plugin for Godot thanks for for building that um, so uh, okay let's let's take a look at at the network back part and the way we are evaluating hundreds of ecosystems uh, at the same time. So we've got this system here. Let me show it to you. This is the whole setup, how everything is laid out. So as you can see, um, let's start on the right. Um, it's a web server, so we have to encrypt it. That's why we use let, um, Let's Encrypt and we have a, an SSL certificate in the front. Then we've got a reverse proxy. This is basically just um, an Nginx server that um, that is the front end for the server. So if you go to our domain, you will hit that proxy and then this proxy will decide which um, service in the background it will use to display the home page. So the general idea is, is, um, is at the bottom of this, of this um, layout. The idea is that we have a website where we can say I want to simulate this specific thing which I'm interested in. Let's say at the moment the mice um, when they are pregnant they have an, like let's say five offsprings. So a mother gets pregnant um, and she will then add five more um, agents to the world. And we're not sure about that. Should it be four? Should it be 20? How does it influence um, the ecosystem? So the idea is Let's simulate all of them. Um, we've got this website here, which is, um, we call it the Trophics Manager. And here we can define test series. 
So a series of tests that we want to perform. I'll just add one more. I call this mouse offspring. I tested this, yeah. I'll, um, it's in the Coyote project because that's what we're working on. Let's say we have a, a timeout of 120 seconds. And um, what we want to, to test out is um, mouse.offspring number. Mouse.offspring number, basically, if you look in Godot, here are our agents, here are the consumers, here's, here are the mice. Um, they've got a script and uh, they have some additional variables. The mouse, mice are a bit different than our default consumer, but if you look at the consumer, here we have, um, we have some variables that define their behavior and one of them is offspring number. So there's just a, a variable in the in a GD script and this is the variable that I'm um, targeting here. So the species is a mouse and the variable is offspring number. And let's say we, we start from 1 to 10 with a step of 1. So um, if I save this, you can see now we have 10 different tests that we need to perform. Um, and uh, the first test is, uh, is an offspring number of 1, then 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. And the idea is we don't do this by hand. We don't start Godot and change the values. But rather what we do is we tell our system that we want to know about this. And we could like add another 100 of different tests. And then in the background, in a Docker container, Godot will start itself and it will simulate our game. And then it will write all the statistics that we are collecting into our database. And then based on that, we can see how it influences our populations in our simulation. So um, let's do this. So I've got a, a worker in the background. Um, it's a Docker container. Um, and basically what it's doing, it is starting, um, it is starting a VNC server and inside of that VNC server we are starting the different um, different simulations. So you can see this is already happening. So inside of the Docker container, inside of a simulated um, xorg server, there are our actual game instances and they are being simulated now. And um, you can look at this. This is already happening. So they are running in parallel. So it could be like if you have enough threads in your, in your computer, then um, it will run all of these at the same time and you will get the information you need pretty, pretty quickly. So the first simulation that was started is already running for one and a half minutes. And the last simulation that was started is, is, has been started like 20 seconds ago. Um, let's wait a little bit, but we can already take a look at it. Um, we are using we are using Grafana, this on on the on the left of this screen, um, to display the information that gets logged. So the path is: we start a worker. We could run a worker Docker container on different computers, for example, in the cloud somewhere or in our production studio on our individual laptops. To, to run as many simulations at the same time as we need. Then each of these will start the containerized simulation, our game instance. Then this game instance will lock this information through JSON, through uh, um, our website, into a time series database. This is where all the information gets stored. And then Grafana can access this database and display the information we have collected. So let's take a look at this. This has run for approximately two, two minutes. We can open the, the graph. And uh, the information we get here is that, um, that the population of the mouse is growing a little bit. The population of the foxes has not really grown. That's because probably if there are only two foxes in the entire world, they will not meet each other. And if they don't meet, they don't procreate. So with a with a offspring number of one, after two minutes, we have about 40 mice. And um, 
let's say with a with an offspring number of five after two minutes we have about uh, 110 mice and we can also see that the more mice there are the more droppings there are but it's not as as crazy as one would think it's it's, it's sometimes it, it works really differently than what you would expect with um, with an offspring number of 10 yeah we are reaching like 200 mice in the simulation um, so this this is the basic idea the idea is we want to design games um, based on ecosystems and uh, the state of the ecosystem decides the progression of the game so what we what we are using it at the moment in is a, is a game we call Coyote I have some screenshots of it um, this is actually the first actually the first um, concept drawing that we did the idea was let's do a game with a with a child um, that is playing on the parking lot of a supermarket and then behind that supermarket this is our ecosystem this is like a, a space where um, where the city has not expanded to yet and an ecosystem is, is happening and as a player we can influence that ecosystem we could influence it in a good way or in a bad way because any action we do will have uh, implications on all the other agents in the system so um, we are at the same time really powerful but also um, we could have a destruction really quickly so this is the general idea of the game and this is where it got us started and then we did a lot of concept drawings the idea is that as the child moves around um, it's playing in that area and um, it is taking on the costumes of the different species in that world so as a player you can be all kinds of different different animals in that in that um, in that ecosystem so this is the the key art we're working on at the moment the idea is that the different species are costumes the the player can can use and then you are um, like limited but also enabled in in the same way that the species is in that in that world so let me show you how this looks in in, in the game um, um, the player the kid is walking around um, the player is also an actor in the in the scene so if I change um, the costume I'm wearing uh, the mice will flee from me because now I'm dangerous because I'm uh, a species that would uh, eat them and if I'm a different species then I could get attacked by the system so it's always a it's, it's always a difficult decision which species should I pick and the species brings with it a certain skill set um, so uh, the player has to decide which is the right costume at the right moment and then there's a second area like we call it the soul world everything is frozen here but there are this is all just concept um, art and program art as well but um, this is basically um, these are the the species themselves so all the mice um, are represented by this one entity you can go there and you can talk to them then they will tell you um, what uh, what would be required of this environment in order for this species to arrive then once you have that information you can go back and you can try to to influence the the ecosystem in that way and, and the more species you add the more complicated it gets the more likely it is that you're going to mess things up and have to restart again um, yes so that's what we're working on at the moment we've also built a basic um, testing platform we call it connect um, where we are sharing alpha builds of our game we add new versions every now and then with a change log and we are really looking for for testers and for feedback and if you'd be interested in doing that we'd love if you would contact us and, and join the testing um, we want to do a, a green light on steam really soon um, it should be online already when the godot con is happening so if that's the case um, Please go to our website, and there will be a link where you can um, where you can uh, give us uh, a green light on, on Steam, which will make a, a big difference. And also, as usual, uh, if it's at all possible for you, um, please um, 
please go to social media and and, and follow us. Um, so these are the the hopes we have for Godokon in in order to support us. So if you have any questions, just shoot away. We'd be glad to to answer them. And if we we can't answer them them today, just contact us on our Discord or Twitter or email. Um, we will we will gladly get in contact with you and and get your information. Bye.